Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I'm Maurice Hoffman. I'm uh, director of the Research Institute for Nature and Forest, which is uh, based here in this uh, building. And uh, I wish to welcome you on behalf of all my colleagues of the INBO um, in, our, in one of Europe's most passive office buildings. It's not about the people in it, but it's about the building that is more or less energy neutral. And it's still one in the top five of European office buildings as, for that issue. And we are glad, of course, to be able to once again facilitate the Maya project. You were here three years ago again, one floor lower in, um, in the, uh, the auditorium uh, there. And we are able to facilitate this Maya project. It's the last opportunity in offering the venue for this final conference. We consider Maya, which is important, an important statement, I think, to be the most important EU project that brings NCA to the national level. Allow me to introduce you once again. I did that three years ago as well, but uh, on, uh, to INBO, what we are about. We are not only about NCA, not in the least. The INBO, the Research Institute for Nature and Forest, is the independent research institute that is financed by the Flemish government. And we underpin and evaluate biodiversity policy and management by means of applied scientific research, data, and knowledge sharing. We are with about 250 dedicated scientists and technicians, strongly driven by science, but certainly also, ab and above that, by their nature conservation and environmental concern. Within that group of 250 people, some 11 of these work on a wide range of issues concerning nature and society. In 2022, to give you one example, some 30 projects within four research programs are in progress. And the research programs are about multifunctional landscapes, on nature in cities, and, and on nature and human health, on farming and biodiversity, and on natural capital accounting. I don't think I need to convince you about the importance of NCA, but nonetheless, I'll give the, the ideas on that within INBO. I think that a large part of society is convinced of the opposite still. Our society is nonetheless intimately riveted to the natural system in which it functions. We make use of the natural capital that our environment offers. Raw materials such as water, wood, food, uh, food and minerals, regulatory functions such as water purification and air purification, and cultural services such as recreation and inspiration. Nat natural capital is the basis of our, for our economy. And it's a hard job to convince policymakers and administrations on that fact. It is the basis for our prosperity and well-being. But the methods we use to identify our economic activity do not reflect the link between economy and natural capital. INBO wants to strongly contribute to putting NCA on the societal, administrative and political map in Flanders in order to give natural capital a more central place in society and ensure that it plays a bigger role in policy decisions. To reach that goal, we really need to work closely with partners to come up with a widely applicable policy tool. INBO also uses the NCA concept in its rec recurrent nature reporting. We regularly report on the state and importance of our natural capital, interpret and explain trends, and make specific political recommendations based on that. We also create derivative applications at the request of users. By working with the standards for NCA, we can tackle this efficiently and consistently. And we, of course, I repeat, proud to host the concluding conference of Maya and to make this last contribution to the project. 
especially after the challenging times that reduced the essential physical networking, not to name COVID, of course. It is inspiring to see so many. I hope it will increase during the day, but I understood that at least some 60 people would be, uh, would be participating today. Um, that so many people will uh, contribute to this concluding conference. We are happy that as also experts and practitioners and, and regional up to European policy involved people are gathered in this room and online. I think that Maya has taken some big steps forward towards implementing NCA in national, national offices, also in the Flemish region. And INBO will further support NCA initiatives with data and expertise. <coughs> I'm just going to skip a part of this. Um, and we remain convinced that harmonized data collection and disclosure will improve decision making and help counter the biodiversity crisis. INBO is very grateful to host you here and we wish you fruitful discussions, a good celebration of the project and, and inspiration for next NCA initiatives. Once again, thank you for your presence and your NCA involvement. I wish you great interaction today and inspiring ideas on the way forward with NCA as unavoidable, basic instrument in planning, in economics, in society. It is one of the ways to make environment the discriminating factor to society instead of a marginal issue that nature once was evolved to in former societal thinking. Have a nice day, have a fruitful day, and good luck with the way forward with NCA. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> For the people online, my name is Lars Heijn. I'm a professor at Wageningen University, and I'm the coordinator of the Maya project. Um, first, let me thank Imbo for very much for hosting for the second time our Maya conference. It's a wonderful venue. It's a great place uh, for discussions. Um, I'll be very brief. I'm not a very sentimental person anyway, but just to look back a little bit on our, on our project, right? Many things have happened in the last, uh, in the last four years. Uh, our project will end on 31st of October of this year, so then we'll have completed four years. Uh, we had the COVID uh, pandemic, of course, which all taught us uh, yeah, to work in a different way. I think in spite of that, we managed to do uh, a lot uh, with our project. At the same time, you see that the, yeah, the demand for this kind of work has, has increased also because there have been many developments in ecosystem accounting. Uh, the, the ecosystem accounting, the first eight chapters of the CIEA were adopted as a statistical standard last year. Of course, that's a, a very big, uh, big thing for, for our field. Uh, we also have commitments from, from many uh, countries to, to continue this kind of work. Uh, the, the European Union is, is considering and is preparing legislation on ecosystem accounting that would make it mandatory for countries to, in the EU to produce ecosystem accounts. Um, the, the G7 uh, last year committed to producing ecosystem accounts. It was in the final declaration of the G7 summit in Germany. And uh, even, uh, the, and I shouldn't say even, and also the USA is, has uh, committed to, to produce ecosystem accounts already as of 2023, which is a very ambitious time scheme. So it's really wonderful to see that so many countries are now taking up ecosystem accounting. And of course, it means that, yeah, we also have to, as, as practitioners, have to deliver and have to actually produce the accounts that, that people need. And I think Maya did make a contribution to that process. We, we really... Yeah, managed to, to, to do everything that, that we planned to do and hoped to do, and, and, and in many cases I think we did even a bit more. Uh, we produced pilot accounts in uh, all the countries that are part of Maya. Uh, we have worked also with, with countries that were not initially uh, part of Maya, some even uh, also presented here today, which is wonderful. Um, we also, as presented yesterday, we worked on a number of innovations in, in ecosystem accounting that will really help us to produce the next generation of ecosystem accounts. So I think all in all, we can be, uh, all of us, quite, quite proud of the work that we did. And I think uh, also the collaboration has been really wonderful. 
so thank you all very much for that. And of course, I look forward to today, where we will uh, present yeah, the, the practical implications of our work and, how, and, and discuss a bit more the policy applications, also, also the tools that were developed and the methodologies. So with that, I will, uh, I will stop to also stay in time. And I would like to give the floor to Claire from the Commission, who is the project officer from the EU. Ah, yes. So, um, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, my uh, final uh, project conference. Uh, so, I am uh, Claire Kiatkowski. I work uh, in uh, REA, the European Research Executive uh, Agency, based uh, here in uh, Brussels. And uh, I had the pleasure to be the project advisor for uh, my uh, project. Um, so, help. I do it correctly, yes. Uh, so uh, I wanted to, to start with a bit of a non-conventional slide. Uh, for those who know, uh, this is an extract from um, from the series uh, called Parliament, the, the French series called uh, Parlement, uh, which is a parody of the European institution. Uh, I personally love this, uh, this parody, and I found it very interesting because they uh, talk about natural capital accounting in this uh, series. So so uh, when uh, they were talking about accounting, nobody wanted to hear about it. But when they started to talk about uh, transformative change and the power natural uh, capital accounting has, then it became a top uh, priority. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted to, to let you know that uh, natural capital accounting attracts more and more uh, attention. It has to be explained in very simple words, uh, despite the fact the, the techniques and the uh, uh, methodology behind are very complex. And it holds uh, promises for, um, from which everybody uh, uh, can uh, benefit. Uh, so this is why uh, we invest a lot in a natural capital accounting uh, project. Uh, so this is uh, Horizon Europe. I will not uh, uh, go too much into details since uh, you know uh, probably more than me this, uh, uh, this uh, framework program. But before we had, uh, for those who were there already, we had FP7, we had, um, we had also uh, Horizon Europe, and um, we, uh, um, we financed um, uh, a lot of projects such as Esmeralda and MAES. Um, and uh, and uh, now, as a continuity, we have uh, also uh, Maya, which is about mainstreaming um, the natural capital accounting in uh, member states. Uh, the next steps will be uh, on the use of uh, natural capital accounting. So we are financing now, and I'm sure you, you are aware about this project, Selina. And uh, of course, what we want also to do is to reconcile a little bit uh, the macroeconomic and the micro microeconomic uh, uh, methods. And we will have a project called uh, CIRCAIVE. We will uh, start uh, next, uh, next year. Um, so thanks to uh, the, the project, uh, the concept of uh, natural capital um, accounting has been uh, further developed and used in uh, member states. Uh, and uh, I am happy to, to see that uh, they fit really well with uh, the current legislation. Um, so they contribute to the design, but of course also to, to the implementation. And I wanted to uh, mention this uh, proposal uh, of uh, this legislation on new environmental uh, economic accounts uh, module, as Lars also mentioned. So uh, it's only a proposal, but with a strong focus on uh, physical accounts and uh, ecosystem accounts. Uh, it clearly mentions the SEEA, and uh, the objective uh, would be to have regular reporting of ecosystem accounts by member states uh, in 
the, the future. So uh, I think that the work of Maya uh, was really relevant in this uh, purpose and the recommendation and the guideline that you have produced uh, will be uh, an added value for uh, the, the member states who will uh, implement this uh, legislation in, uh, in the future. Uh, so we see really the relevance of uh, your work. Uh, I wanted also to mention the um, Directive on Corporate Sustainability Reporting. So um, it has been adopted also this uh, year. Um, so it is more on the microeconomic, on uh, the uh, private uh, sector uh, level. But still, I think it has a relevance because I think that in the future, what I would like to see is also uh, that uh, the micro uh, uh, economic accounts feed into the macroeconomic uh, accounts. But uh, let's see, so they call for standards as well. And maybe there is an opportunity to uh, uh, converge the, the two uh, methods. Um, so uh, I wanted to, to thank you. Thank you for uh, your invitation. Thank you for uh, your attention. But thanks also to uh, Maya Project and for all of you who contributed to uh, the success of, uh, of the project. Uh, I hope the deliverables will uh, still remain available and be used uh, uh, by the member state in, uh, in the future. And uh, so we keep in touch for the last, uh, last uh, steps of, uh, of the project. And uh, I wish you uh, a fruitful um, day to, today, a fruitful discussion. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alessandra Alfieri, uh, and uh, um, I'm responsible for the program on environmental economic accounting at the UN Statistics Division. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, um, organize, the organizer, in particular Lars Hein, for the invitation uh, to um, to give some uh, some general overview on the um, SEA um, and, in particular, the SEA ecosystem accounts. So this whole discussion started uh, during the 70s uh, when there was uh, a recognition that headline indicators such as GDP and unemployment did not capture the full economic contributions of nature. Increasingly, uh, the, um, the fact that uh, the economy and our well-being depends uh, um, on nature and also affects um, uh, nature um, has, becoming, um, has, coming, has, be, has come as at the forefront. So um, the SEEA really feels this uh, information need in providing uh, integrated information that links uh, the um, environmental and economic information. So while the SNA is the statistical standard for measuring the economy and from which economic indicators such as GDP are derived, the SEEA um, is the uh, information system for the environment and it applies an accounting approach to um, measuring the environment and thus allowing it to link with the economic information of the system of national accounts. There are also a number of subsystems that go further into the details and build the bridge with a different um, thematic community like water, energy, agriculture, forestry and fishery. And now we are working on measuring sustainability of tourism, ocean accounts and biodiversity accounts. Now, um, what happened in March 2021 when the SEA ecosystem accounts was discussed at the UN Statistical Commission? First of all, it was agreed to remove the uh, word experimental from the title, and this is quite an important uh, achievement. It was agreed to um, adopt chapter 127, uh, describing the statistical framework and the, the uh, physical flow accounts, namely um, the uh, extent, condition, and ecosystem services accounts in physical terms as a statistical standard. Recognize that chapter 8 to 11 um, are um, internationally recognized statistical principles and recommendation for valuation of ecosystem services. So although chapters 8 to 11 are not at the same level of chapter um, of the physical accounts, they, um, there, there was a recognition that this significant um, uh, advances were made in the context of valuation 
and uh, they were recognized as principles and recommendations. Um, and further, the Statistical Commission encouraged countries to implement the SEA ecosystem accounting depending on, um, on, on, on countries' uh, priorities. Last, last year in March 2020, actually this year in March 2022, um, the Commission um, adopted the implementation, implementation strategy which aims at uh, scaling up the implementation in countries. So um, what, the, what are the SEA? We um, kind of like to present it as two faces of the same coin. Um, on one side, there is the um, SEA central framework, which uh, measures the economy from the perspective, the environment from the perspective of the economy. So it looks at uh, um, environmental assets as individual resources and um, the uh, provisioning services that these environmental assets provide in terms of timber, water, fish, and so on. The ecosystem accounts take a much an ecosystem perspective and um, measure the ecosystem services that the ecosystem assets provide to, um, to the economy and human activities. One important characteristic of the ecosystem accounts is, the, um, uh, is the, that the, the accounts are really spatially explicit. So we are talking not only of tables, but also of maps. So uh, the model that we like here is to have the SEA as uh, um, the, um, the statistical framework that underlines um, many uh, different initiatives that require um, uh, different information. So here I would like to highlight in particular two initiatives. One is um, the Convention of Biodiversity, um, as they will have in December, um, they will um, adopt their global uh, biodiversity framework, including a monitoring framework. And um, a number of the indicators proposed um, are um, relying on the, the uh, SEA ecosystem accounts, and in particular on the ecosystem extent accounts and the ecosystem services accounts. And uh, climate change, there is a, a new data gap initiative promoted by the G20, um, which includes uh, um, climate change as part of it, and in particular calls for the um, implementation of uh, um, energy um, air emission accounts and carbon footprints energy accounts, um, expenditures for climate change, and uh, uh, subsidies impacting climate change. Um, the, um, after the SEA ecosystem accounts was, uh, uh, was published, there was a, a tremendous, I would say, a, a huge uh, uptake of the SEA. So it started with the Secretary General calling the adoption of the SEA an historic step towards transforming the way how we view and value nature. Also, Franz Timmermans uh, recognized um, this uh, SEA as an important framework to move beyond GDP and better account for biodiversity and ecosystems in national planning. Most recently, the G7 climate, energy and environment ministers um, committed to further mainstream biodiversity in decision making by supporting the implementation of the SEA both central framework and ecosystem accounts, and mainstreaming, uh, the, uh, mainstreaming it into policies. Also this year, the, um, a coalition of, uh, um, of, uh, of finance ministers um, issued a, a document on nature-related risks and policy actions and calls for the Ministry of Finance to, um, take, um, to, to manage nature-related risks by um, implementing basically the SEA, developing valuation and applying metrics and decision support tools that basically that take into account uh, nature loss scenarios. So just a, a brief overview of the SEA implementation. We have about 90 countries compiling the SEA central framework, 30, 37 compiling the SEA ecosystem accounts with different uh, shades of blue representing different stages of implementation with the dark blue representing regular compilation and dissemination and here Europe is all dark blue thanks to also the regulation um, that has been adopted for the SEA central framework and hopefully it will be also all blue in the context of the um, ecosystem accounts shortly. 
um, there has been uh, a steady increase in the number of countries implementing the SEEA. Um, now we are at 90. Uh, the pandemic had a quite a big impact because uh, uh, countries basically did not start new implementation. Um, uh, and, but we hope that this, uh, this trend will, um, will reverse. So what is the governance mechanism for the implementation of the SEA? We have the Statistical Commission, which is basically a body, an um, intergovernmental body of the um, Economic and Social Council of the UN and that has established the Committee of Experts on Environmental Economic Accounting, which has the responsibility to um, setting the standards for uh, the, um, and maintaining the, um, the SEA its implementation and its uh, mainstreaming into policy. So there are different uh, um, working groups that are working on specific areas. In the context of ecosystem accounts, uh, the focus, um, we have taken a, um, a thematic approach uh, because uh, to be closer actually to the policy discussions and also taking into consideration that uh, the experts working on forest deal across the type of accounts, extent, condition uh, and services, as well as valuation, although valuation requires a different set of experts. Um, and uh, um, and the, the working groups are is primarily focuses, focusing on identifying um, practical, um, implement, uh, practical guidelines for implementation for um, ecosystem extent, condition uh, and services and its integration into areas for SEEA so that it will allow countries with um, uh, not a lot of expertise to be able to uh, start the compilation of these accounts, at least using um, global uh, information and then improving uh, using national data sets. So the SEEA has uh, provided an important contribution uh, in particular to make um, nature uh, count uh, uh, within economic planning and decision making and develop a common languages that brings together different experts from different disciplines and mainstream the consideration of nature into policy and decision making. Uh, standard, standardization is important. Um, it is also important to work across uh, disciplines and, and bringing together different stakeholders. One um, organization alone cannot compile the accounts and it is important to involve the users from the beginning. And the accounting framework provides basically a, 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 a statistical framework to organize information from different sources, which supports also the derivation of indicators, but not only indicators, but also um, uh, modeling and um, different type um, of analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandra. I know it's not here, it's, an, uh, it's a recording, of course. And please apologize as it was late because I was waiting for a bus to never arrive. This is a strike. By the time I changed my route, I was late. So our next speaker is Bram Edens. I think he doesn't need any particular introduction. He has worked for many years in the UNSD and he's going to give an uh, overview of the basic biophysical ecosystem accounts. So please, Bram, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro. And good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you had a, a better night's sleep than I did. Um, this jet lag is giving me a hard time. Um, but it's nevertheless, I'm very happy to be here with you in person, um, and thank you, yeah, organizers, for the invitation to speak about uh, biophysical modeling for ecosystem accounting, and specifically also about the uh, the guidelines for um, biophysical modeling uh, for ecosystem accounting that we released uh, a couple of months uh, ago. So the outline of my presentation is as follows. First, I'd like to uh, say a bit more about the natural capital accounting and valuation of uh, ecosystem services project, uh, uh, another EU-funded project that ended uh, about a year ago. Then I uh, would like to say a bit more about the uh, ecosystem accounting implementation strategy that Alessandra mentioned. Uh, then go into uh, the biophysical modeling, uh, why it is important, and also introduce and say a bit more about these, uh, these guidelines. 
Uh, and then finally, I want to discuss, um, reflect on also future opportunities for, for um, biophysical modeling and, and draw some uh, conclusions. Um, so while we are, of course, here today to, I think, celebrate the, uh, the, the outcomes of the Maya project, um, I, I, yeah, I wanted to uh, say a bit more about the, uh, about the NCAVES project, um, which is, I think, in many ways also uh, complementary uh, to, uh, uh, to the Maya project in the sense that it uh, piloted ecosystem accounts in a number of uh, partner countries to the EU that you see listed here, uh, such as Brazil, uh, China, uh, uh, Mexico. Uh, and the, um, in addition to the piloting of the um, uh, accounts in countries, uh, the, uh, we also had a number of uh, cross-cutting work streams. Uh, so one of them, for instance, on the alignment also with uh, uh, natural capital accounting efforts in the private sector. Um, we also had a, a work stream on indicators. Um, but uh, I think just what we are here to, to discuss, uh, I think, uh, in this session is um, also the work stream on guidelines and methodology, uh, where we uh, collaborated also closely with, uh, with the Maya uh, project. And perhaps I should also mention here that it was also a project jointly implemented between the UNSD and, and UNEP. Uh, specifically the TEAP team, so we also had a work stream on applying the um, accounts in countries in, in all sorts of policy scenario analysis. Um, yeah, as Alessandra already mentioned, that we have these uh, uh, global uh, implementation strategy for, uh, for ecosystem accounting, where the overall objective is to scale up the uptake of ecosystem accounting uh, in countries. Um, and um, we um, have uh, as a, a target here that we would like to see at least 60 countries implement at least one account uh, of the CIEA uh, by, uh, by 2025. And we have what we call a global assessment, so we, uh, what was also in Alessandra's uh, presentation, so we annually uh, update the number of countries uh, uh, compiling uh, the CIA, uh, which is actually has now also become one of the SDG indicators. So the approach and main principles of the implementation strategy you see here in the figure. Uh, so first of all, it's, um, uh, the, main, the first principle is multi-stakeholder engagement, uh, both at the national and international level. So I think at the national level, it's very important, ecosystem accounting being uh, very much a multidisciplinary effort that you bring together uh, the various agencies involved, which can be, of course, the statistics office, the mapping agency, but, but also technical agency, but also bringing on board the, uh, the various line ministries. Uh, likewise, I think internationally, uh, we um, uh, yeah, foster collaboration also across the various international agencies uh, supporting, uh, supporting countries in, in implementation. Secondly, a flexible modular approach. Um, I think recognizing that you can't do all the accounts and you can definitely not do them all at once, starting uh, with uh, the, the accounts that are most policy relevant. A tiered implementation, uh, and I'll say a little bit more uh, about that later, but basically uh, recommending, um, uh, and this I think particularly pertains to developing countries, to start with for a basic experimental account that you can then uh, um, show to, for instance, your policymakers or donors to really show the interest and in, uh, what it is capable of doing, and that you then can gradually uh, improve and expand over time. Finally, uh, yeah, a regional or sub-regional approach and south-south collaboration. Basically, the idea here is to facilitate also uh, cross-country exchanges, for instance, also uh, between countries that uh, speak the same uh, language. So there are a range of activities in support of the implementation, starting with uh, capacity building. So we have e-learnings uh, that uh, people, uh, practitioners can do self-paced. We are now in translating them uh, into French and, and Spanish. Um, secondly, the development uh, guidelines and materials to support compilation, which we are introducing in this, uh, this session, strengthening collaboration, um, and then also um, um, data, uh, data and tools uh, to, uh, to support uh, uh, country compilation. And I think that will be the topic of the, of the next session. And then, of course, communication and advocacy, uh, specifically, I think, also towards the, the policy community, I think, is also key. Um, yeah, so statisticians sometimes get a little bit nervous when you uh, mention that you uh, need modeling, um, and I can tell because I consider myself uh, a statistician. Um, so why do we need the uh, biophysical modeling? Um, so I think we need to recognize that uh, ecosystem accounting is, I think, pretty ambitious in the sense that it's trying to bridge statistical 
the statistical and the geospatial uh, domain. So we talk about accounts, which are essentially summary tables, but they're being derived in this case from underlying maps of, of, of information. So why do we need modeling? Um, well, I've, for some of the surfaces or condition indicators, um, so we, we have the statistical information, uh, but it's often only available for certain locations or for certain, uh, for instance, for at the municipal level. So we need often modeling techniques to basically to spatialize that data, uh, to allocate those data also to the ecosystem types that then supply, for instance, these uh, ecosystem services. And secondly, I think also quite key is that some of the ecosystem accounting concepts, think of something like water flow regulation or sediment retention, by uh, their own nature re require a model to, to capture and to, to measure uh, the service. The third thing I wanted to mention here is that, well, while biophysical modeling may be necessary, um, it can never replace uh, data collection processes. Because I think Earth observation data, for instance, uh, yeah, they're only as good as, I think, the ground proving or the training data sets that you're able also to feed uh, the models. And there are, of course, many also models that require also in situ data, for instance, for, uh, for model collaboration. Um, now turning towards the biophysical guidelines, so why were, the, uh, why were they uh, developed? So I think uh, diverse models and tools uh, have been developed uh, over the past decade, and uh, I think it's a rapidly evolving uh, field. Uh, but they have not always been developed specifically for accounting purposes. However, many of these models or, 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 or platforms can be, can be used either directly or indirectly uh, yeah, for ecosystem uh, accounting purposes. And explaining those linkages or how that can be undertaken was one of the, the core objectives of these, uh, these guidelines. Uh, in terms of the audience, so we assume familiarity with the CIA ecosystem accounting, uh, but no, uh, let's say, prior knowledge of, of biophysical modeling or, or GIS concepts uh, per se. Uh, in terms of process, they were developed under the auspices of the UN Committee of Experts that uh, was also in the presentation of Alessandra. Uh, and we formed an editorial board consisting also of representatives, for instance, from the INVEST, from, from IES, from, from LUCI, but also other experts uh, like Lars uh, contributed to, uh, to its uh, development. So we developed a draft, we held a global consultation, we received feedback from about 50, I think, countries uh, and uh, or international organizations and, uh, and experts. Um, and yeah, the final draft was adopted by the UN uh, Statistical Commission last year. Uh, I wanted to emphasize here that given that this is such a rapidly evolving field, uh, we, and even though we have a PDF that people can download, we really see this as a living document. And we also made explicit in, in the guidelines that some of the key tables are also on our website and we plan to continuously update as new tools and new data sources uh, develop. So in terms of the, um, the content, so um, I think chapter two, I think is interesting because uh, we um, included here also what we call process guidance for agencies. So this is really more targeted at managers, suggesting how people can go about setting up an ecosystem accounting uh, project. So both in terms of what kind of skill sets would you need, um, what kind of uh, software is around, uh, but also, for instance, what are some best practices from uh, many international agencies uh, involved in um, setting up, for instance, coordination structures in, in, in countries. And um, I must say this, I think, is also primarily more targeted to, uh, to uh, developing countries. Then chapter three is talking about, um, for instance, various um, uh, uh, modeling techniques and modeling platforms for ecosystem accounts. Chapter four is going in more in depth into uh, uh, extent accounts uh, and also explaining the difference between land, uh, land accounting. Uh, also summarizing some of the key uh, global data sets that are uh, around in uh, land, cover, um, uh, land cover products. Uh, the chapter five on the condition account follows basically the ecosystem condition typology uh, and then highlighting specific variables and how to go about modeling or measuring them. In chapter six, uh, we go into the ecosystem services accounts and we currently cover uh, 10 different uh, ecosystem services. Uh, and then we go into the, um, yeah, the steered approach and I have an example uh, later on. And then I think there are a couple of other chapters um, with um, uh, hopefully relevant uh, information for, for practitioners. Um, so we follow a tiered uh, approach, uh, I think inspired at first also by the IPCC guidelines that sort of 
are set up in this, uh, this way, recognizing that countries are in different, uh, find themselves in different circumstances, both in terms of data availability and also uh, technical expertise. And uh, yeah, basically the idea is illustrated here in this figure on the right. So a tier one uh, approach would, for instance, be modeling an ecosystem service using uh, global data sources uh, and, and a global, perhaps uh, a basic uh, model. Uh, a tier two would, for instance, uh, use the same basic model, but then apply national data, national coefficients, uh, uh, ideally at a higher resolution than in tier one and then tier three would really come to using a, a tailor-made uh, model with national data uh, yeah, uh, applicable specifically uh, and calibrated for the national uh, context. So this is an example um, or basically an overview of the various uh, modeling techniques that we distinguish and also describe, uh, ranging from, uh, well, I think pretty basic uh, lookup tables uh, through uh, yeah, spatial interpolation, uh, geostatistical models, of course, also uh, various uh, process-based models, uh, and we also have uh, a bit of content on, uh, on machine learning uh, uh, in, the, in the guidelines. Um, we also have an overview of uh, platforms uh, with potential use in CI uh, ecosystem accounting. Uh, and well, this list is not, I think, exhaustive, uh, but we, we selected based on uh, these platforms being open access and then also, yeah, having potential, I think, for, for ecosystem accounting. So they're listed here in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, so we have IS, um, uh, Data for Nature, which I think is the new name for NSIM. Uh, well, Estimap, I think, doesn't need an introduction here in the European uh, context. Uh, Invest, I think, probably uh, most widely uh, known and used in, uh, in, in countries. Uh, iTree, and then also Nature, Nature Braid, a new name for Lucy. Uh, but as I was saying, I think this is, was, this is a, 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 a sort of a living, a living document. So, uh, and I think in the next session we will hear also more about different uh, new, what is it, platforms like the Inca tool and others uh, that maybe uh, should be added to this uh, list uh, going forward. I want to say a little bit more about the, uh, the Arias for CIA Explorer, as that was also, um, um, uh, this project was also initiated as part of the, uh, the N, uh, NCAVES uh, project. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm very uh, glad also that F Fernando uh, is here, and he will later, I think, give also a, a demonstration. Um, so basically, um, so there's the Arias platform, but the Arias for CIA Explorer is a specific application on the platform. Uh, which uses global data and models uh, to, uh, to generate, uh, so it's, basic, it's capable of generating a basic set of ecosystem accounts that is then fully linked and, and consistent with the CIA, uh, IA, um, basically anywhere on Earth. So user uh, specified, uh, so you can yeah, choose a country, a watershed, or another area. Um, so why were we... Um, why did we decide also to, to partner and develop this, uh, this application? Um, so I wanted to highlight two elements here. So I think the first one is that we really saw a need to lower also the barriers to compiling ecosystem accounts for countries, and I'm having specifically here developing countries in mind. Um, so as I was saying before, ecosystem accounting can be challenging, uh, multidisciplinary, also requiring GIS techniques and so on. Uh, and we've seen that it sometimes takes many years to really build that capacity in countries. So we wanted to have something making, making it easier to more quickly generate results and get that dialogue also with the policy side uh, established in countries. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to highlight is really this potential also to derive all sorts of indicators. And specifically, we have been looking here at the, um, yeah, the emerging uh, uh, post-2020 uh, monitoring framework of the global uh, biodiversity uh, framework. Um, so this is an example then um, from this chapter that we have on these 10 different ecosystem services of this tiered approach, uh, focusing here on carbon or global climate regulation, as it is called in the, the CIEA. Um, so, for instance, a tier one approach that is then described in the guidelines uh, could, would be, for instance, uh, using uh, uh, invest uh, uh, carbon storage and sequestration model, which is essentially a single layer lookup table, or the Arias for SIA uh, default model, um, which is uh, slightly more sophisticated. It's a multi dimensional lookup table. Um, tier two approach could then well, consist of applying those 
sort of ready-made models, but using your own national coefficients or national land cover maps. And then a tier three would really um, be about applying a, yeah, a tailor-made uh, bespoke model, for instance, having higher certification uh, in different types of forest, for instance, um, more details on, on soil parameters and, and, and so on. Just to give an illustration of this sort of tiered uh, recommendations. Then thinking and reflecting also about uh, uh, sort of the, the road ahead. Um, so we developed an interoperability strategy for SIA accounting that specifies roles and responsibilities of data providers, uh, modelers, and institutions. Um, and uh, it also um, uh, formulates this idea to move towards interoperability, specifically uh, semantic interoperability of data and models. So, for instance, uh, having custodians of data sets, and that could be, for instance, uh, organizations uh, like uh, ESA or, let's say, the national mapping agencies, uh, to share data through uh, APIs and, and, uh, and nodes. And, of course, a lot of this is already happening. But then also to interconnect uh, those data through shared semantics, shared ontology uh, and, um, and, and classifications. Uh, and I think another opportunity uh, is really uh, working towards future data uh, becoming account ready. I see here, I think, uh, a big also demand for uh, now there's the new um, generation, I think, of high resolution uh, satellite imagery uh, going towards 10 meter. But I think there's a wide proliferation of all sorts of land cover products. But I think from an accounting perspective, there's a clear need to have also long time series, but then there I think are all sorts of challenges also how to connect sort of the higher resolution that you may have for recent years with other land cover products that may uh, have a long time series. I think uh, there's a, yeah, a great need for that uh, by countries also in, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, reporting to these uh, various environmental conventions. So let me conclude. So I don't, yeah, so I think there's no sort of one size fits all. Um, I think the, the choice of approach, models, and tools will very much depend on country-specific circumstances uh, in, in, when we're talking about uh, biophysical modeling. Um, oftentimes, we need a combination of techniques. Uh, this sort of tiered uh, approach uh, uh, allows for a growth model of accounts compilation. Um, as I mentioned, biophysical modeling may be necessary. It uh, will not, never be sufficient. Uh, yeah, and I um, spoke about also this, uh, this, this strategy we have uh, based on interoperability of data and models. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to uh, say. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I hope I did fine with time. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. We were all very happy to have you here in person. But the questions, we will collect them after David's presentation, if you don't mind. So now we introduce the next speaker, which is David Barton from Nina in Norway and part of Maya. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. So thanks for um, inviting me to present on monetary accounts. Um, and I'd also like to uh, thank... Um, I am a bit sentimental, Lars. <laughs> so I, I'd like to show my sentimentality at the beginning. and. And first of all, thank you for inviting Nina and my colleagues to contribute to the project and also thank all the colleagues here for a very interesting uh, four years working together. Uh, uh, and most of it was maybe uh, online, but at least the beginning and the end is this physical presence. And uh, I feel like we have a really good chemistry and I hope we find opportunities to work together moving forward. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Bram for helping me uh, or joining in this presentation and you'll see why this is a joint presentation in a minute. So in the, in the outline, um, I'd like to uh, uh, briefly connect back to um, Alessandra and uh, Bram's introduction on the perspectives of monetary accounts from the perspective of, of CIEA, the UN, and also uh, briefly pass by the regulation again. Um, then I'll spend most of the time on the joint uh, technical report, uh, which we produced in Maya with NCAVES on monetary valuation. Um, and then I'll end up with, uh, with some reflections on moving forward and testing and monetary accounts um, in the context of different policy making uh, purposes. So, um, Alessandra um, uh, made a good introduction about the purposes of the CAM um, in general. And uh, 
much of this is the same then for monetary accounts, that one of the main purposes of doing monetary accounts is to achieve a, a statistical standardization or a comparison um, across the work that's done in different countries. And to make it compatible with the SNA, uh, it's needed to use um, exchange value principles for doing uh, monetary valuation of ecosystem services. And uh, um, in an anecdotal way, uh, ec ecosystem services um, are being treated similarly to the way unpaid household work uh, versus paid household work, which is uh, reflected in the SNA. There's a sort of metaphorical similarity between the two in how we're extending the the production boundary, the scope of, of the SNA. Uh, of course, um, we're not just doing this to have comparable statistics and for statistical agencies to talk to each other um, and for countries to compare their progress on measuring ecosystem services contributions to the economy, but it's the reason we're all here is to change decisions, to transform decisions. Um, and the uh, uh, monetary accounts, uh, more than any, speak to um, making visible the contributions of ecosystem services from nature to the economy and people. And it's also uh, a basis for better recording impacts that economic and human activity have on the environment. So being a basis, a database for conducting better environmental impact, uh, strategic environment, in, environmental impact assessments. Um, in the work that we've been doing um, in Maya, it's coincided with uh, working groups uh, preparing the SIA year. Um, and uh, in that work that we've done uh, together, um, we've seen uh, challenges that uh, uh, implementing SNA valuation principles have for valuing ecosystem services. Obviously, in non market situations, that's why we're here. We're here to, <laughs> to capture the non market situations. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, these challenges haven't all been resolved to the level at which they can uh, become a standard. And uh, Alessandra mentioned that they are these internationally recognized statistical principles and, and recommendations. Uh, so the chapters on monetary accounts are chapters 8 to 11. Uh, and these are uh, statistical principles, but there is a request then from the Committee of Experts on Environmental and Economic Accounting for a continued research agenda on methodological aspects of uh, standardizing the choice of monetary valuation methods. There's a large range of things you can do, but at some point, as Alessandro also was, Alejandro was uh, mentioning yesterday, at some point we have to land on a common way of doing things, recognize the boundaries of, of those ways of doing things, what's in, what's out, but make a stand on what, what we choose. And that's a continuing research agenda to move the monetary accounts from principles to a standard. Uh, then I'll just uh, pass briefly by then what, what is the implication then for the proposed uh, regulation um, on introducing environmental economic accounts modules. Um, the current situation is that uh, um, reporting on monetary accounts is not part of the, the proposal, but there's a, an amendment to for the Commission to carry out a methodological and feasibility study on monetary valuation of ecosystem services. Um, and at some point in the future, when, when the Commission is happy that uh, um, more standardization has been reached, it can propose to include monetary accounts as part of the reporting standard um, under the regulation. So uh, the main part of my talk um, is on uh, the uh, uh, Maya uh, and Caves technical report that we produced together. Um, we, we, uh, we found out that we were uh, working in parallel tracks uh, a couple of years back, and uh, we were contributing material. Uh, Maya was contributing material to the NCAVES project technical report, and at some point we decided there's no point in making two, we should join forces, and I think the product has been uh, become uh, much better for that reason. Uh, it's important to say um, in the initial uh, description of work in Maya that we discussed that we would uh, produce guidelines, but I think uh, during the progress of the, the work, and also as you see the way the Statistical Commission landed on monetary valuations being principles. It's, it's obvious that we, at this point, can't provide clear guidelines. If we'd been able to do that, maybe this would have become a statistical standard. So um, we've agreed with the NCAVES project um, and the UNSD that this is a so-called interim technical report. And as uh, Bram was saying in his introduction on the biophysical um, uh, guidelines, 
this is also a living document, if, if anything, even more living than the biophysical guidelines, given the need for this uh, continued research. Um, and the, the work continues in the thematic working groups uh, that uh, Alessandro and Bram were referring to, uh, on e.g. on forests and, and oceans. Um, the SNA uh, revision process also has a well-being and sustainability task team. There's a working group on SNA valuation principles, and in the private sector there's a task force on nature risk financial disclosure, and in all of these initiatives, uh, approaches to monetary valuation of ecosystem services are being, being um, uh, tested and narrowed down. Uh, the report um, that uh, is now available, uh, has been available since the beginning of the summer on uh, Maya and UNSD websites, um, is, uh, contains an introduction, uh, um, a reflection on the foundations of um, evaluation of ecosystem services. It lists the different valuation methods, uh, both uh, the ones that are um, uh, considered or recommended as accounting compatible and also a review of the ones that are uh, not, uh, so that we know where the boundaries lie. Um, there's a list of valuation of, eco sorry, um, of ecosystem services, and then for each ecosystem service, there's recommendations on the, the types of models uh, types of methods that would be implemented at tier one, at tier two, tier three, following a similar but not identical logic to the tiers in the biophysical guidelines. There's a chapter on valuing ecosystem assets and then a number of other considerations, which is maybe where I'd go first if I was a practitioner. Uh, in practice, what do you have to do to generate, to generalize monetary values from certain areas to the whole accounting area, value transfer? what platforms and tools are available, um, issues of aggregation, and, and uh, very importantly, how do you communicate the strengths and weaknesses of, of the uh, um, monetary accounts to decision makers. The tiered approach for selecting monetary valuation methods is not as straightforward as uh, was presented in the biophysical guidelines and linking back to the way um, the IPCC th thinks about it. Um, there's Two, at least two things, or maybe three things, going on in the tiers. So uh, one of the reasons to prefer one method over the other is that the, uh, the method type has a closer approximation to exchange values as they would be recorded in the system of national accounts. Uh, similar to that is whether the, uh, the uh, method um, uh, is addressing an ecosystem service that contributes to SNA benefits or non-SNA benefits. Often the methods that are calculating ecosystem service values for non-SNA benefits are more experimental. There are more alternatives to choose from. And finally, maybe the, uh, as Alessandra was saying, the great innovation of, of um, ecosystem accounts is the spatialization of the data. So also the, the prices, the accounting prices that are used uh, should ideally be spatial, and of course that is a huge agenda for environmental economics to, to achieve that. And so all of these things are going on in, in uh, selecting which is a tier one, tier two, or tier three method. But in general, the, 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 the more advanced methods have spatial economic data, and of course the information costs for data collection go up. Um, with all the options that are currently on the table for methods and all the different assumptions that can be made in implementing a single method, it's really important to illustrate the range of values that may come out for the accounting prices of ecosystem services. And a convention would be to use in the accounting tables the rec uh, or record the most conservative, lowest value, but to report on the range of values that can arise from using different methods at different tiers and also to illustrate uncertainty through sensitivity analysis. I'll spend a bit of time on this um, illustration, which uh, tries to sum up <laughs> uh, some examples from a very big uh, lookup tables where you have uh, proposals for um, uh, methods at different tiers by different uh, ecosystem services. On the left-hand side, we have this target, which is to um, illustrate uh, the proximity of the, the method group to benefits as they would re be recorded in the SNA. So those, that refers to the table numbering. So the, the uh, ideal methods, um, let's say, holding spatial data constant, if it doesn't matter how much it costs to get the spatial data, you would always prefer prices that are directly observable. 
if you can't get that, you'd go for uh, prices for similar markets, uh, and next prices embodied in market transactions, and moving away then and often uh, looking at um, the non-SNA benefits. Uh, you'd often end up using uh, uh, prices for revealed expenditures on related goods and services, or prices from expected or simulated expenditure um, or expected markets. And for um, the different ecosystem, or a selection of ecosystem services from provisioning, uh, regulating, and cultural, um, as you see, uh, there's, there's not a sort of um, complete ordered logic of where the tiers appear, because it, because it depends a bit on how spatial the, the, the method is. But if we look at crop provision, for example, a tier one or tier two method would start with a resource rent or a residual value met methods. Initially, a tier one method would be calculating resource rent uh, based on macro figures, um, uh, but not having uh, that data spatialized. A tier two method would be to be able to spatialize the data by allocating the, the resource rent based on uh, regional, local, for example, agricultural statistics. And finally, a tier three uh, method or two tier three methods could be a micro, sorry, productivity a change based on a factor analysis of the inputs into crop production and separating out statistically the contribution of ecosystem services. Or uh, a preferred method would be using rental values from, um, for agricultural land, which are spatially explicit. And so you see a, a combination of being close to market values and spatially Explicit data means that the tiering is not completely ordered according to this closeness to SNA valuation principles, but pretty close. And so it's a bit more complex than in the tiering in the biophysical. Uh, in, air, in air filtration, uh, uh, you don't have any immediate um, market-related uh, prices, but you can, for example, value air filtration regarding um, uh, the, the cost savings that people can avoid in averting behavior, for example, investing in air filtration units in uh, a city with a lot of air, fil um, air pollution. Uh, bring down the air pollution. You don't have to have the air filtration units. You save costs on, a, on this adverting behavior. Uh, and a tier three method would be on looking at the, the savings on, on uh, damage costs uh, uh, to materials from corrosion of air pollution and also on uh, savings on costs of illness. And on the recreation side, well, then this uh, illustration extracts from these big uh, tables in the, in the report that a, a tier one method, uh, which would be uh, using market prices, would be to look at what recreationers tourists spend on uh, going to a recreation site, uh, on, uh, on staying at a, uh, near a recreation site, market prices. Um, when you move from, from um, tourism to... Uh, to um, uh, to um, visiting recreation sites, maybe without overnighting, uh, travel cost methods, uh, but only using the travel cost data uh, for an, from an expenditure point of view, not to calculate consumer surplus. Um, and then finally, um, if you don't have any of these alternatives uh, and um, you also want to do um, a method that's more close in principle to exchange values, but is more complex uh, you use the simulated exchange values, and um, Alejandro was giving some very good examples yesterday of, of, uh, of that, um, if for those of you that were, were here. And so um, this is a work in progress. I would say that the same as, as, as Bram said, that this is a living document. These tiers <laughs> might shift up and down as we do research and we find out which methods are easy to, easier to find spatial data on and which methods... Uh, have less assumptions, and then these recommendations in this interim technical document might be changing, these tables might change as we move forward. Um, one important thing is uh, you never have data for your whole accounting area. Um, Bram was saying that you need to generalize uh, um, biophysical data, and that's why you have biophysical models. Well, completely analog to that is that you need to generalize prices from from surveys, or uh, you need to generalize uh, um, uh, estimates of uh, marginal ecosystem service value from sample sites to the whole accounting area. And uh, a very well-known approach is uh, value transfer in environmental economics, except here we're doing value transfer not from one site to another, a study site to a policy site, but we're doing it from a study site to the whole accounting area. And um, 
a tier one approach, a low tier approach, would be to use existing uh, values from existing studies, what we would call um, a value transfer and maybe very simple non-spatialized unit value transfer. Uh, and then moving through different valuation methods where you, for example, start to use functions to adjust existing price data to the location so that it becomes more spatially explicit. And finally, the end goal for, for um, statistical agencies is to do uh, primary um, data production on, on spatially explicit um, values for, uh, for ecosystem services. That's a pretty long way down the road, but that's where we, we should end up so that we don't use these transfer methods and, and in the end and everything becomes more reliable. Uh, yeah, so I'm nearing the end of the, of the presentation, but um, we do have, given the, the large number of options for monetary valuation methods for accounts, um, we do have um, a challenge to communicate why it's important to do this and what it does and what it doesn't do. One of the communica uh, communication challenges is that exchange values cover the contribution of ecosystem services to the economy because it follows an exchange value principle. It tries to link explicitly to economic activity. Uh, and when you do that, uh, your estimates uh, are typically um, in the range of, for example, from the study from the Netherlands, using, uh, doing as comprehensive a, uh, an approach on different ecosystem services as was possible with the data. You come out with a equivalent annual values to about 2% of GDP, and, and it, coincidentally, when the UK uh, did exactly the same, not exactly the same effort, but the exactly same scope of effort, uh, they came up with very similar figures. But if you look at other ways of uh, other methods, complement, complementary methods of, of identifying the importance of, of ecosystem services and nature for the economy, you can end up with, with larger figures. For example, the, gross, the World Economic Forum study using gross value added um, ended up saying that there's some kind of dependency on the economy of half the world's GDP on nature. And for example, the famous Costanza study, which found that the, the, the welfare value of, of ecosystem services is, is a one and a half times the size of global GDP. So these are different methods. We have to explain to people that different methods give different answers. The scope of the methods uh, give different answers. The methods have different purposes. And in the case of exchange values and monetary ecosystem accounts, where we're visualizing, uh, identifying the contribution to the economy specifically in a consistent way with the SNA. Finally, my last slide, um, pretty on track, that's good. <laughs> we, uh, um, I'm particularly fascinated in, in, in my work about how we then use this consistent database across countries with uh, consistent sets of methods to, uh, to inform policy. Um, and now I'm jumping ahead here. I've got my head on the, the next slide. Um, a few, uh, before I get to policy applications, a few uh, observations on things we should say when we present accounts and what we should present with accounts. Uh, I already talked about exchange values having this particular application in the previous slide. Uh, there's a large constituency, um, let's say in the environmental um, conservation NGO sector, um, which will maybe focus on uh, the monetary accounts as the be-all and end-all of this exercise, which it absolutely is not. Um, biophysical accounts are a type of valuation. It's a type of plural valuation, if you think in the IPBES sense. So the combination of accounts, biophysical and monetary, is a plural valuation exercise. And the exchange values we reflect in monetary accounts obviously do not re reflect the full importance of ecosystems for people in the economy, but if you take the system of account, system of environmental and economic accounts, the ecosystem accounts across the whole range, uh, you cover much more than uh, we have so far of, of, uh, of plural values of nature. Um, they're limited in scope to use instrumental values. Um, the prices that are used don't capture potential or capacity of ecosystems, so that has to be dealt with in, in a different set of information. Um, <clears throat> the range of uh, monetary and non-monetary um, metrics is needed to see together. When you present your monetary accounts, you need to read them together with the biophysical accounts to, for, to make uh, a policy making sense of them. Um, and that was my last point there. And I see that you're moving closer and closer to me, which is making me nervous. <laughs> so uh, without reading the details, because maybe your questions will be focused on that, um, uh, I'm very, very um, uh, I think the, the, 
the, the system of accounts with the monetary, monetary accounts do a huge job in raising awareness about the importance of nature, orders of magnitude of values, and we have to start filing these methods down so that we can start moving towards um, <coughs> change detection and economic impact assessment, which means that the methods have to be able to uh, detect a significant change in, um, in the economic value of ecosystem services between one period and another, which is either due to change in demand and or due to change in the physical supply. <coughs> uh, it needs to be good enough to do priority setting, so look at the trade-offs between ecosystem services, both in physical and in uh, economic substitution sense. And the end road would be to be able to integrate, the end road of this in terms of transformation of society would be to integrate this data in the design of policy instruments. I've finished now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much for this presentation. Now we have time for some question to both to Bram's presentation and to David's presentation. Uh, I'm sorry to take the floor, but it's not really a question, it's a, it's a clarification. So I, I would like to explain that, that in addition to the NCAVES biophysical guidelines, there's also a Maya biophysical guidelines. And it's good to mention that because, of course, this is the, the Maya symposium. And uh, Bram very well presented the NCAVES biophysical guidelines, which are indeed the most elaborate guidelines <laughs> at this point in time. Uh, the Maya guidelines are on the Maya portal, and they deal specifically with Europe, and they zoom in on specific ecosystem services, so they're quite complementary. And they also comprise a, a comparison of the, the modeling platforms, such as ARIAS and, and individual ecosystem services models. Having said that, uh, I think uh, that there's, there's more work on the way, of course, in terms of guidelines, and in the Inca project, and I think that's good for you to be informed of that as well. Also in the Inca project, there's guidelines, uh, guidance notes, they're called being prepared. Um, by uh, Eurostat with technical experts and uh, a number of member states represented in the task force. And the idea of this uh, guidance notes is that it would be specifically applicable to Europe. They focus on biophysical service modeling and they're quite detailed because it's like 10 to 15 pages for each individual ecosystem service, plus a guideline for condition accounting and a guideline for extent accounting. So in that sense, there's a number of, of guidelines and I think it's good to, to mention that. Uh, in, indeed, NCAVE's guideline is the most comprehensive at this point in time, but there's the Maya guideline, complementary, and in, in uh, well, I'm not sure why I'm using this one actually, but the, um, the, 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 the Inca guidance notes are also becoming, will become online uh, ne next year as well, so just for your information. I've got many more questions on the, on the, the, the technical elements of the valuation part, but I think I'll, uh, I'll live in my time to do it. So thank you, I think we have a question at the end. <coughs> Ram, you're going to come and support me? Yeah, thank you. My name is Kaja Oras, and uh, I am from Statistics Estonia, and I'm a project leader on environmental uh, ecosystem accounting, and I'm also a member of Eurostat Task Force, uh, which is dealing um, uh, with ecos uh, ecosystem accounting. And my question goes to first to David, and, and with plural... Plural... I say it. Plural, I can't plural, say it. Plural, yeah. Yeah, plural leadership. Uh, Okay, in sense of plural values and the tiered approach, uh, uh, it, it could make the um, 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 uh, valuation kind of manipulative uh, results, and uh, we will land in different results if we apply different methods. Tell us what what uh, what do you mean? Uh, what uh, what do you, how do you see uh, who, who has the res responsibility kind of um, uh, a responsibility or uh, who is could be in charge to say, uh, in saying which uh, valuation methods uh, would sh shoot to certain ecosystem services and. Um, uh, uh, and I question it uh, from a viewpoint of, uh, in order, uh, uh, having question in, uh, in my head, uh, how to uh, kind of land on uh, on similar or uh, and comprehensive co comparable re re results um, uh, among the countries. And uh, second question go <laughs> goes to yesterday, as uh, Alejandro Caparros uh, noted that uh, the welfare uh, values are compatible with CIEA and SNA. So, and you mentioned this uh, today. Tell us, uh, uh, what do you uh, how do you feel? Are, are the welfare values uh, compatible? And uh, uh, what would be these steps uh, in order to take them into account? And... Uh, Maybe something later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Yeah, maybe I'll get help from you, Alejandro. <laughs> uh, the first question is, is, um, is uh, maybe an unfair question because I'm only a researcher and you're asking me to make a recommendation about the governance of uh, international statistics. Um, I mean, I would, I would say that the UNCEA is the reason we have a body like that to, uh, to have a negotiation on how monetary accounts and the methods will contribute to global nature governance. And uh, um, it's not my role to... Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think that's... In a body like that, or, uh, or in Eurostat, for the, in the case of the EU, the, the member countries have to uh, negotiate a common position on a standard. And I think that once they can just reach this minimum standard, then, then you have a platform on which to build and move forward. And there's a, obviously that's the way you work with the minimum common denominator. Beyond that, I don't have any recommendation. And when it comes to the welfare values being compatible with, uh, with the accounts, I think uh, what you meant was that the data you collect in for uh, using welfare-based methods can be reused or repurposed to, for example, simulate exchange values. It's not exactly the way, or at least the way you said it, it's more that the data can be repurposed for another approach which is closer to the SNA evaluation principles. And if uh, you may want to support me in that or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. One quick comment and one quick question. First a comment, I'm happy to see that it arrives now in this community that when we talk about economic or monetary valuation, it should also be called like this. Because before it's always biophysical valuation and valuation. And if you talk about valuation, it has always been meant monetary. But if you think about interdisciplinary cooperation and multiple values, I think it should be made very clear that it's economic or monetary valuation. Mm. Don't use the term valuation if you talk about... And it happens now and then, you mix it, or other, other persons here mix it valuation and they mean only economic. So it's very important, I yeah. think, to make clear what is meant. Then a question to mm. David. If I understood you correctly, when you talk about value transfer, you mean values are not transferred from one side to the other, just values from the same side are used uh, for the whole study area. But wouldn't then be value extrapolation be the better term than value transfer? Because you're not really transferring, you're just extrapolating one value. Just to be very clear in the terminology when we yeah. talk about spatial, spatial mapping of these values. Yeah, um, well, to, that, to the first question, I think the, um, I was coincidentally involved in the IPBES or the best values assessment. And there were a lot of uh, a fair number of references to the SIA uh, in the in the well, IPBES was had a focus on plural values and and it consciously refers to SIA as one a big contribution to plural valuation thinking. And uh, I myself fall into the trap as an environmental economist of saying valuation and 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 meaning monetary. But I'm trying to change my brain to to do what you said. And I think if people want to find arguments and policy messages to support what you just said, the best values assessment is a nice place to go. And I think there's a lot of cross-fertilization between the, the UNSD, the UNCA, and IPBES in that sense. Um, and regarding, um, regarding the terminology for what you do with uh, um, monetary values that are from a certain number of sites, we've, in the report we use the word value generalization, which should cover both the biophysical and the monetary in the sense that um, that you're generalizing value from a few points to a, a, an area. But that, that terminology hasn't been completely mainstreamed. But we're kind of working on that to be a kind of common meeting ground for the biophysical and the, and the monetary. I think we had a question yeah. at the end, maybe the last. Uh, I have a question to David. You mentioned in your conclusions this, uh, in the topic priority setting and uh, the need for comparing uh, trade-offs between different ecosystem services. Could you, you didn't have time to provide more details on that. It would be very interesting to, what, uh, to know what you exactly mean and whether it, it is sufficient to do it from the economic point of view, I mean, just using some economic approaches, or do we need also to integrate biophysical modeling into that? And from this point of view, I would be also interested to know whether you already plan some activities uh, linked to the um, World Bank uh, efforts to, uh, to extend GTAP modeling framework to account for ecosystem services and deriving general equilibrium prices for ecosystem services. 
Well, okay, that was way beyond my competence. <laughs> so the last, I can answer the last question first. No, I, I haven't because I don't work in macroeconomic modeling. Um, so unfortunately, I can't answer that question. But in the ten sense of, of uh, trade-offs, um, uh, studying trade-offs with accounts, I mean, there is a, a biophysical uh, dimension to it that when there's uh, land use change, uh, a shift from one ecosystem type to another, there's also a, there should be a visible change in the, in the uh, provision or supply of ecosystem services across those land use changes. So that's one um, trade-off analysis that can be used. And in the monetary accounts, well, if, they, if, the, if the prices are capturing demand in a spatial sense, uh, and there's, uh, some of the ecosystem services are uh, provided and enjoyed on site, and other ecosystem services are regulating and provided on site but enjoyed somewhere else, then you should be able to see in, in spatially explicit prices also some um, trade-offs and substitutions uh, in the price data, which will be additional information to the biophysical accounts. But I'm thinking, I'm talking now very much from a microeconomic point of view and not from a general equilibrium point of view because I don't work in that and know that, but it sounds like those things will complement each other with, from a top-down and a bottom-up uh, approach. So I'm sorry I can't help you on the last one. <laughs> Maybe we have one last question from Ram, if possible, because we had kind of focused, because we are covering both. We are supposed to cover both. Is there any questions? Yeah, Bram. Um, David was already mentioning the, the, the plural values and also the IPBES uh, report. And I'm now looking here at uh, figure two from the summary of policymakers. And there they also um, illustrate that plurality by also having um, different. It's a figure uh, values topology. And then you have four different world views on natural capital, uh, living from nature, living in nature, living with nature, and living as uh, nature. Yeah. And in each, associated with each of these world views, uh, there is a list of, um, of, of broad values, specific values, and also value indicators, including monetary. And so for the living from uh, nature, then for instance, you have market prices, yeah, but for the living in nature, uh, which focus more on well-being, then you have also willingness to pay. And so that is a completely different approach to uh, uh, um, selection of valuation methods than we currently uh, use, yeah? because here also in these presentations, it was about the selection of which is the highest priority valuation uh, method. Well, this, at least presented in this IPBES report, there is the option of having multiple valuation uh, methods which are reported in parallel to each other, because they don't replace each other, but they complement each other. So my question for you is, um, especially given uh, the focus, for instance, of NEC, uh, NCAVES on uh, developing countries, where all the, also these other world fields might be more important um, than, than only the, 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 the anthropocentric uh, perspective, yeah? would there be scope also in the future in SEA for having multiple values running in parallel? No, no, th thanks for that. So I think in terms of, yeah, thinking also about the, um, yeah, what is it? How to situate SIA in the broader values uh, discussion. I think the extent and condition accounts can support, I think, various worldviews, as you put it. But I think um, in terms of the, uh, when we really move towards monetary valuation, I think also the CAEA itself, I think, makes clear that then we're taking a specific, more instrumental or use perspective on the environment. And we are there constrained by the, really the, the goal to be consistent with the, uh, the SNA, uh, with the idea being that we really want to mainstream biodiversity into, into economic uh, decision making. But also I think in the CIE we have this chapter on where we also go into complementary valuation approaches. So, so I think there we can bridge also, for instance, to, towards welfare, uh, welfare perspectives. And I think Sometimes also the comparison of these different values can be uh, what, what makes, uh, makes it very policy relevant. So thank you very much all for attending. We have eaten up already half of our uh, coffee break, so I think it's time to conclude. So thank you very much. Maybe a round of applause.
Okay, so we're moving in the agenda from guidance to tools to support implementation of SIA. I'm very excited about uh, these sessions because we do have a very excellent four speakers, but the time is very tight. So they're going to have 10 minutes each, and then after each, uh, all the presentations, we will take 10 minutes uh, questions and answers session, OK? So the first speaker you all know is Lars Haynes, professor at uh, Wageningen University and the coordinator of Maya. And he's going to talk about the global data sets and innovative tool for ecosystem accounting. So um, I'm going to give you, when there is two minutes left, I'm going to give you a signal, OK? I should be on time. So hello, everybody, again. and. Uh, this is a topic where you can talk about for hours. Uh, of course, 10 minutes is not much. My, uh, and my apologies for this uh, very poor graphic. But what I wanted to say here is that I think in the last 12 years, we've, done really, uh, we've made really great progress in, in designing the CIEA. It is, it, is, it is not entirely finished, especially with regards to valuation. But uh, I think we, we have to, to, of course, we started this process already, but we have to, to move a little bit beyond kind of integrating the CIEA and, and all these data sources that are available, how we can tap into that, and of course also to, to forge a stronger link to the users of the accounts. But just to clarify, my presentation will only be about this part. So some of the data sources that we can use in support of CIEA that I think have, have potential that is as yet yeah, not fully tapped into. So, um, and the, the good news here is that, that, of course, there's so many data sets that, that are uh, now available globally at high resolution, et cetera. And uh, it, these are data sets that you can either include to develop your models for in biophysical models for ecosystem accounting, maybe for valuation, I'm not sure, but I think biophysical accounting uh, for sure, uh, or even uh, data sets that are kind of almost or, or completely account ready data. So some of the data can be used as input into models, and other data is, is kind of what you need for accounting. And I, I, my feeling is that you've got you know, different types of data. Uh, you've got observed data from Earth observation. And I think um, in most programs, you can expect regular updates. I think that's very important that if we have data sources for accounts, that you need those updates uh, in time, because otherwise, yeah, you, you can't use it for accounting, obviously. Uh, we need to understand the accuracy of the information, which I think is the case with this observed data in general. And of course, increasingly, the, these data sets are freely available, which I think is very important too. Then, uh, of course, there's all kind of projects all around the world uh, and countries, continents, globally, that, that produce model data. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the problem in a way is if this is data that is coming from a sp specific project, that project may have a specific lifetime, and then your updates are not uh, guaranteed. Um, and your accuracy, um, yeah, may or may not be given that really the quality of the data depends upon that project and, and the people involved. And of course, the third type of, of data is crowdsourced data, all the data that, that people make available on social media and, and how to use that. And that, of course, requires a bit of effort to, to get access to the data. And Elon's presentation yesterday was really all about this. Um, and then a challenge here is that, uh, yes, indeed, the data or this information is, is available. Uh, online and it is likely to, to continue to, to, to be available in the future, but uh, access rights may change. So it may be that, that some uh, yeah, uh, internet uh, platform decides not to make data available anymore in the same way that it has to, which has happened to Strava, actually. Now, I started searching in preparation of this presentation for a global data set. I was really overwhelmed with everything I found. I had actually no idea that you could find a global uh, data on road density or livestock density. Uh, livestock density I knew, but still. Uh, canopy height, uh, annual average PM2.5 concentration. So this, again, of course, from satellite data. And then you can see that, that so much of the data is really exactly what we need for ecosystem accounting. And, and uh, I think Ferdinando will explain how this data is, is uh, used in, in ARIES. But, but uh, yeah, I, I, my feeling is that really that there is more data that, that we, can, we can use. And I wanted, to, in the, the rest of the presentation, give a few examples of things that, that we're working on at the moment in Wageningen. Um, because I think it is kind of, yeah, I hope at least it's a bit state of the art in, in terms of how we can use global data sets. Uh, this is um, our efforts to model carbon stocks and flows um, where we use global data sets with uh, 30 and 100 meter resolution 
Uh, in the past, it, it was available for only a few years, in this case 2010 and 2019, but such data sets will be updated much more regularly in the future. So it's good to develop the, the methodology. For quite a number of countries, we have got uh, data on carbon uh, stocks and, and flows from uh, national forest inventories or LIDAR data. And there's more countries, but just to show a few countries with the data points, uh, you see these datas are, the data are really from all over the, the globe, although Africa is a little bit underrepresented, I should say, in this kind of data sets. Uh, and then what we're trying to do is, is to develop a carbon account based on uh, our uh, models, which is, uh, um, yeah, it's all machine learning models. Uh, these are the original um, uh, data sets, and then we, we kind of combine the data sets, we, uh, we add machine learning uh, uh, protocols to that, and then we have error-adjusted um, data on uh, the carbon accounts, and the good thing is that we can actually uh, calculate the accuracy of such models, and we've got the feeling that, that this kind of work really yeah, will make it very easy in the future, and it so really will make it very easy in the future, right, to produce such kind of accounts. And of course, once we've got this developed, you know, we can easily scale that up to many countries in the planet, and of course, the more national data there is, the more accurate the model will be, but even for countries without data, I think we're able to say something quite sensible about carbon stocks and flows. So that is, um, yeah, I think th something that, that is a really exciting development. And of course, we are not the only one working on uh, carbon in Wageningen. But we do this together with, with many partners also, by the way, right, with, with German partners and the European Space Agency. So this is, these are big projects that we use the data from for our accounting efforts. Elon talked about this already, but, but not everybody online perhaps also was present uh, yesterday. So the Strava model. Uh, can be used for, for looking at how people uh, use walking paths for recreation. And there's other social media uh, data sets. Strava, the problem was the access rights changed over time, so we couldn't use it in the future anymore. Here, I think, for cultural ecosystem services, yeah, the holy grail for us really, I think, is use mobile phone data, uh, maybe Google Maps <coughs> data. There's, I'm sure there's other data sources that are perhaps equally unwilling to share data with us. Um, but uh, yeah, if once the, by the time we get anonymized uh, mobile phone data, that's the time that we're really going to be able to map cultural ecosystem services in a very accurate way, in a very easy way as well, is my feeling. But unfortunately, getting that access is at this point in time the bottleneck. Elon talked about this as well, uh, measuring landscape aesthetics based on uh, uh, Flickr images that, that people post. Uh, so we're really to kind of pr able to predict um, accuracy or pr predict the, the, the attractiveness of the landscape and the aesthetic service. Um, and the nice thing again is that we have some idea of accuracies because we can compare to, 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 actually to actual data sets where people rank those images and rated those images. This is a slide for which I'll take a little bit more time because uh, it, this is the most exciting research for my, in, in, in my team at the moment in Wageningen. And uh, it's, it's on, on one hand really interesting and the other hand really scary. So this is about the rainfall regulating service. It is mentioned in the CIEA as one of the important ecosystem services. I think it's also the most underestimated ecosystem service. Perhaps it is less relevant for Europe. Surely it is less relevant for Europe compared to Africa, Latin America, Australia, um, Middle East, uh, Kalimantan even. So it is, uh, and, and, and basically the story is this, that, that of course uh, forests have uh, relatively high evapotranspiration rates, so they recycle water back into the atmosphere, and that water then ends up as rainfall. And if you look at the interior parts of the continents, you'll see that, um, yeah, much of the rainfall, so, on the, so I should say in this way, and on the coast, most of the rainfall you get is from, the pri is, is from, from evaporation from the sea, yeah? so it's the first rainfall cycle. But if you move more than a few hundred kilometers away from the coast, so you move inland of continents, then your rainfall is, is usually secondary or tertiary, so there's a number of cycles, and these cycles are maintained by your forest. So basically you cut the forest and you disrupt that cycle. And uh, I think, yeah, as I said, it's a critical, crucial ecosystem service provided all over the world. Uh, we're not capturing that well. We, don't, we do not capture it in the accounts yet. We, we don't even know how to model it, but again, with some machine learning approaches, and I th I'm really impressed by how accurate we got these models. Right, because you can see here some, some points in Africa, and you can compare measured and, and modeled um, rainfall data. This model runs on daily time steps over 20 years, having all kinds of input parameters. Uh, and yeah, and even also if you look at the spatial patterns, it's a different graph, I don't have it here. You can see that the model really is able to kind of yeah, reflect on, on rainfall. Then you, we cut the forest in the model, and then we have at least have an idea of what happens to rainfall without forest. 
And of course, now it depends on what you replace the forest with, right? If you want to calculate the ecosystem service in an accounting manner, you would re maybe replace the forest by bare land. In this case, it's already bad enough to replace the forest by pasture, which is the process that on that's ongoing. If you look carefully here, you see the green boundary, which is the Amazon. Um, if you cut all the forest in the Amazon outside of protected areas, right, which is one policy option with the current, yeah, which is, yeah, okay, it's not, uh, in, in principle, forest is protected in Brazil. Um, but at the same time, enforcement is, is a problem. And, and in, in the worst case scenario, I'm not saying this is a likely scenario, but, but if this were to happen, you would see that the impacts on, on rainfall in Latin America would be really dramatic. Some, some, some of these areas would lose 70, 80% of the rainfall. This is not published yet, so we're still kind of grinding through the details, um, but 80% but rainfall loss is of course uh, something where you say, okay, I'm losing, actually I'm losing my whole agricultural system, I'm losing my economic system, I'm losing my livelihoods. But I think that is, and this is without climate change. The same thing we saw in Africa, that is published already. Um, so it's something we really have to think about. We, we can in, in include in the accounts, but I think also the relevance goes beyond accounting. But in any case, I wanted to kind of give this as an example of how you can use big data, machine learning models to model ecosystem services in a fairly accurate way at continental scale, but also with high resolution, so you can include them in national scale ecosystem accounts. Um, I'll skip this presentation, uh, this, this slide. Um, so uh, I think in terms of, of, this is my last slide already because we, there's not much time. Huh? So how should we kind of, yeah, maybe move forward in, in getting access to the data? Of course, we, uh, I think as a community, perhaps we could sp kind of consider spending some time on, on, on really assessing which data sets are out there already, <laughs> and what's the accuracy, the resolution, the timeliness, and if they are also regularly updated. So those criteria I mentioned. Uh, my feeling is that we need some yeah, collaboration or some repository or center or whatever with long-term funding to kind of store this data, to make this data so available to support accounting efforts, especially also in developing countries, right? And some of the models, you know, we, we can't ask all the African countries to model carbon stocks or rainfall regulation services, but we have that at a continental scale with sufficient accuracy. You know, people can just use it, countries can use it. Uh, so we need to make sure we get new data, we get access to the data. Uh, <laughs> And uh, of course, we need to think about how to make data available. That's the topic of some of the next presentations. And um, then I think also that as with that rainfall, I think the, the yeah we, we are really developing new insights in how ecosystems support the economy. And I think our the, the importance goes beyond ecosystem accounting. So um, we should reach out to businesses, maybe natural capital accounting in businesses, or even the investment community and ESG investment. Uh, to make sure that, that that understanding that we've reached over all these many years of work is actually used also in these important processes where, in my mind, today there is actually a lack of consideration of scientific information on environment e and, and economy interactions. Gosh, I had to talk fast to stay in 10 minutes, but uh, this is it. Thank you for listening. Okay, um, let's move on. So our next speaker is uh, Bruno Smet. Uh, he's the head of the vegetation group in Vito, and he's an specialist on remote sensing applications. And he's going to explain us a few examples on EU-wide data sets and information systems for ecosystem accounting. Okay, thank you. So thanks to the organizers for being here. I'm not part of the Maya project, but I'm happy at least to uh, explain a bit our contribution to the INCA uh, program. Um, so as I think everybody knows, the, uh, the INCA uh, uh, program, which is already for several, uh, uh, several years at least, mainly hosted by the GRC, uh, uh, doing several publications on uh, some pilots uh, on ecosystem uh, service accounts. Uh, but as it was also mentioned by Bram, I think this morning in the table, it's not appearing uh, at least because it's not publicly uh, available. The models are not there, so you cannot access them. Um, so that in combination with the EU regulation, uh, which, is, was, which was also mentioned by Eurostat, at least we are supporting uh, the, uh, the Eurostat and the, and the GRC uh, to uh, provide at least these methodological guidelines. Uh, so uh, taking the CIA uh, uh, specification, taking the CIA guidelines, uh, also the member state inputs through, uh, through an exhaustive progress of task force, as well as also, I mean, the Maya uh, work uh, that has been done, trying to collapse that all together into very practical guidelines for member states to 
generate uh, the accounts to support the legislation. So um, I think Eckhart uh, will uh, present that a little bit later uh, in the next uh, session. So I will focus mainly on the Inca account tool. So that's a tool that, uh, that we are developing uh, for, these, um, for the member states uh, to, uh, uh, to create the accounts to support the legislation. So um, we are starting from the, the, uh, the pilot uh, uh, from, from GRC. Yeah, updating and enhancing them based on the guidelines and as such at least create service accounts for different multiple users. We have a feedback loop with uh, the task force, uh, so a number of, uh, of testers at least within Europe uh, such that it can be used both at national scale as well as EU scale and it will become open source. I'll, I'll show that in a minute or explain that in a minute. Uh, so the conceptual model is simple. We just follow at least the model which was uh, there uh, as uh, been uh, already published uh, several times uh, in the Inca part. So having the potential demand to calculate the actual flow in the biophysical uh, uh, part, having the supply in the use table. And there is also, I mean, in the tool, we also do a monetary uh, valuation uh, part, but that's not uh, part of the legislation at this moment, so that you can consider it a little bit more experimental uh, part. Uh. So the architecture is um, very simple. Uh, so we have an Inca core uh, part uh, which uh, support uh, the model as I presented it in the previous uh, uh, slide, uh, or different models, I should say. There is data coming in at least uh, from a, a local file system or network access, uh, yeah, and it generates a set of reports. Now the access to the, uh, the models uh, can be done there is a QGIS plugin, uh, which I'll show in a minute, uh, which you can use to load safe parameters, do the calculation and inspect the results. Uh, uh, that's for more basic users, which can use the basic or the default data sets, as well as proficient users who can uh, update uh, the parameters in the model, who can uh, update uh, the data sets towards uh, national uh, data. And then you can go one step further because the models uh, are becoming open source. So expert users are also have the ability then uh, to uh, use like Jupyter Notebook or even command line just to, to run uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the generation of the accounts. Now one important part is yeah, all these data, like, like Lars already explained, they are very heterogeneous. Uh, so there is a lot of work to be done at least to prepare these, uh, these data sets such that they can be used in the models. And we are there working uh, a bit as what we call an account ready data uh, hub at least is to do, uh, to provide a set of tools uh, at least that we hopefully later can embed in some platforms uh, which do all this pre-processing uh, uh, of, uh, of the input data sets. Uh, I also like to mention that, I mean, the model should be feasible at least to use in other uh, user interfaces like in the ARIAS program. And I can already, I'm happy to announce at least that uh, next month, so in, in two weeks, we will start a project for ESA together with, uh, with Fernando, Ferdinando and the team at least to, uh, to explore not only uh, adding more earth observation data into the models, but also to incorporate these models in the ARIAS uh, platform and create as such uh, a European, uh, let's say, ARIAS variant. Uh. Um, so the Inca core, like I said, you have all the different services, so they are following all these building blocks, uh, following the potential demand and the flow, etc. So there are a lot of uh, building blocks uh, inside, uh, so it's a modeler uh, design. Yeah, then um, I think what is also important is that, uh, yeah, like I said, we start from the Inca pilots uh, from GRC, but we are trying to make them fair. Yeah? So this means that, that they are findable. So every algorithm has a kind of a, a DOI that you can see, okay, this is the version that you have. Uh, there is metadata which we added uh, at least into the account. So when it's produced, what are the units, what are all the inputs being used, etc. Uh, accessibility, uh, so okay, free and open source. So we will uh, uh, make that available. I mean, we uh, early uh, 2023, the first version will uh, become online. Uh, okay, there is an insta installation user developers manual. Uh, it supports different users and it's able to run on a regular PC within a certain amount of memory as well as uh, scale up to a higher end, uh, end machine. Uh, so it supports both Linux uh, and Windows or it's tested at uh, Linux and Windows. And like I said already, it's compliant to the CIA EU guidelines, common API, and it's, uh, there is also a harmonized reporting. So, I mean, we are cloud optimized GeoTIFF are coming out, CSV, X Excel uh, templates are being used that all the reports are uh, according to uh, a harmonized uh, format. Uh. And then, of course, the reusability through the modularity. Now, I'm, I, I will refer at the end of the presentation at least a publication we did. We did some investigation on how, fa how fair are we, and there is still work to be done. So that's also very clear, and uh, I'll, I'll give the reference later. Uh. But okay, we are doing step-by-step step, uh, trying to proceed uh, into this uh, interoperability. Uh. 
Now on data input, um, yeah, I don't have the time in 10 minutes to go through a lot of data inputs, but I can say at least for the accounts that we created, uh, at least the nine accounts, uh, Inca accounts that we um, yeah, uh, kind of extended uh, at least. Uh, so we have at least a linkage table. So it's one of 21 rows of uh, data sets. But I think what is important is that you see that temporal resolution is not always matching. So you need to then cope with, okay, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, what are the limitations you introduce? Yeah, uh, we link it also to uh, which component. Is it for potential? Is it for the demand, uh, uh, et cetera? Uh, like I said, there is very complex pre-processing. So I think, um, I think if, if you need to create a new year account, I think you spend uh, a lot of time, at least uh, half of the time, I think, in just preparing all these data sets. And I think, like Lars also said, uh, I think in, in his concluding slide, that's really some work we need to, uh, to, to deal with. Uh, so the mix of the different data sets, but also yeah, area of interest, spatial resolutions, projections are not the same, etc. from all the different parts. So you need to cope with that. And that's why I said we have some pre-processing tools, but that's definitely work that needs to, uh, to continue further. Uh, and I think also configurability is important for us for member states because we want member states to, to be able to change things. So we have made a split between the data area where we do the calculation on and the actual reporting area, so to decouple them. And uh, we provide for all the data sets, we provide what we call the default EU data, such that member states uh, can use that data and create kind of default uh, account and then uh, also have the ability to, uh, to change these, uh, these data. And I think that's on the next slide, for instance. This is an example of the QGIS plugin for tourism recreation. So on the left side, you see the, the QGIS plugin uh, part, so the user interface. So there is some metadata uh, that you can uh, add it, uh, you can run it. But here you see already, okay, you, you choose the year. You see some kind of these italic things that are just the default settings uh, which are there. So, uh, I mean, uh, uh, countries are, have the ability to, to change these or just use the default one, so they don't need to bother with everything. You see, of course, the, the region you can select uh, or the nuts level, uh, the land cover uh, map you can change, but then you need also to provide at least a mapping uh, table uh, to ecosystem types. Um, and then at the bottom part, you see, uh, yeah, you select in the middle, you select your service, and then at the bottom part, you see a lot of parameters, at least, that you can give, in this case, for instance, for the recreation, like uh, ecosystem type weights, uh, you have the accessibility map, facility map, et cetera, et cetera, so that's conform the guidelines that we do. On the right side, you see the output, uh, so we have the, the geospatial maps uh, coming out, uh, like you for the supply. Uh, and then you have the, the tables, the supply and the, the use table. I showed here just the CSV that uh, you see the different ecosystem types, which are here 11 ecosystem types. So that's the new, let's say, uh, uh, yeah, revised mass, at least for uh, uh, European ecosystem extent uh, typology, uh, what we are using. Uh. So we, used, we have been using this tool uh, already um, from, let's say, also a command line perspective. Uh, so uh, previously, at least the Inca accounts, as they were published also by a report uh, by Eurostat were covering 2000, 2006, 2012. So through this link uh, now where these uh, are published, uh, I mean, we use this tool to generate already the 2018 uh, uh, accounts. And next year, we will extend the series with an additional year, including a pre-processing of all the other years, because we want to have consistent time series, which is important. Uh, yeah. So these are the services in the tool, what you can see. Uh, so the, uh, by the end of, uh, of the year, um, at least uh, we will, or oh, beginning of uh, 2023 it will be, so we will open source the one which are in green and the one in the yellow uh, part we are working on, on, on that one and they will, they will become available uh, by the end of uh, 2023 and perhaps a couple of steps in between. And like I said, for the EU uh, 2018, we have these data sets already crea created with the series from 2000 and for 2021 uh, at least next year we will uh, do an additional, uh, additional run. Uh, with uh, the, also the new and revised models according to the, the guidelines. Uh, so that's my last slide. If you want to know a little bit more, okay, there are some blocks. Uh, so if you go to that one, but I think the most important is, like I said, I mean, we have been, uh, there is some more information at least in the publication which, was, which came out, I think, in June, I think, uh, uh, May, June, uh, just before the summer holiday uh, period where you, where you can read more at least on on this uh, Inca uh, tool, or this, re this reference tool, at least for the, uh, the Inca methodology. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bruno. Now um, we're moving from um, to showing some tools to really a demonstration. 
of ARIES. We have here many times about ARIES, so we have very happy to have here Ferdinand Villa. He's a professor at the Iker Basket at working at the Basque Center for Climate Change, and he is basically the coordinator of all these ARIES systems. So, this. Thank you very much. Okay, so I was promised to use a browser. I'm not having you look at another PPT. I hope you're, la you're happy about that. But I need to use uh, Google. Okay, Google Chrome here. And I have to type an address which is complicated, so my time starts after this is connected. <laughs> I have, uh, the time I don't have will be spent 30% uh, in talking about areas, which is something you probably heard about. And I can assure you that I, almost everything you heard is wrong, uh, for reasons that I will explain. And then the rest uh, of my presentation will be about uh, the use of areas as an application to support the natural capital accounting and uh, everything that we are interested in in this audience. So I will start from the so-called explorer, which is the simplest way. Let's cancel this one. Let's not care about this. Uh, why does it go to the Basque country? Oh, because if I say... Well, if I say yes, it will probably move me here, but uh, maybe not, not this time. Um, so uh, Arias is, uh, uh, you heard about a tool, about a model, about a, a lot of different things. Arias is a very different thing, and this is not Arias. This is just an interface, just an aspect of it. Uh, this is, uh, is to Arias what a browser, a web page is to the internet. Arias is a platform where you can put data and models. You tag them with semantics so that machine, not machines, not the machine because it's a distributed system, know what they are about. Uh, and what they need in logical terms, so in semantic terms, I need elevation, I need biomass, I need temperature, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and that's all you tell. Uh, and then you can ask a question, a question to the system. So you can ask a question like, uh, we'll never be able to type it in here because of the keyboard, but something like, I want to know about, um, I don't know, maybe vegetation carbon mass. Vegetation, okay, vegetation species. Vege I'm just looking for you know, the queue that always pops in. Where did, did I? Oh, God. Uh, yeah, well, okay, I'll just press the space bar, okay? That, this will never work. Okay. Uh, you, you can ask a question using just simply the semantics. I have some predefined questions here. The system knows where I am, like Google. Uh, much, much less evil than Google, but uh, it knows uh, that they may be interested in ecosystem service issues. So I can, for example, click this. Uh, I could have typed it in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a coordinated way, and this goes to a semantic uh, uh, knowledge base that utterly drives me and, t and helps me while, while I type. So the system starts uh, to find a way to observe this concept in this concept, which is a map that I'm using, and uh, builds uh, what it deems to be the best strategy. Where is the mouse pointer? Jeez. Oh, now I lost the mouse. Anybody sees an arrow? Oh, it's in the screen. Yeah, thank you. God, Christ. It's in here, but I cannot find it out. Okay. Okay, I'll be very careful where I touch, thank you. So the system builds uh, a strategy, I'm already over with my time, uh, which is basically a model that has been built here. So uh, we have been uh, already said, uh, we already said that areas do uses global models, global data, et cetera, et cetera. That's not, absolutely not the case. The areas basically builds the model, it can, be be it can build, the best model it can build for each situation. And in this particular case, it found some local tab mod table model for vegetation carbon mass, which is a, a result that you can get here. And if I can point at this, you will see that in raster terms, uh, and you can get uh, vegetation carbon mass in here. Uh, every question is OK with areas, and uh, the ability uh, to uh, add to the system data and models by just tagging them, putting them on a server, which doesn't need to be our server, and uh, tagging them with semantics makes the system 
uh, able to uh, address larger and larger questions. For example, if I ask something, if I ask something incredibly complicated, and the system doesn't have, doesn't find a strategy to compute that using the semantics and the machine reasoning that goes behind all this building of models. Uh, somebody else might build a, a data set or a, a smaller model, like a model component that actually makes that possible tomorrow. And from that point on, it will be possible for the system to compute that model without having ever added that model to the system. So it's not a matter of adding one model, the other model, and then running those models. Each different concept is used uh, uh, independently, and the machine is able to connect them, and the ranking that the machine does enables it to uh, choose the most proper model for the context using local data when possible, using global data when not possible, using more specific models depending on the context, on the resolution, and on the temporal context that you, uh, you can uh, add whenever, wherever you want. So I have to accept a lot of disclaimers, thanks to the United Nations. And uh, what I did now, and you can enter directly from this interface instead of uh, the one that I showed you before, is uh, the application that we've been building in the last uh, year and a half with, uh, with the United Nations Statistical Office. Abraham is uh, the leader of this, of this part from the, from the United States Nation perspective um, that uh, enables us to um, connect uh, natural capital accounting and all the different C accounts uh, to uh, the, the functionality of areas. What is basically you're seeing is a thin layer of uh, functionality that is being uh, uh, put on top of the system. So you still have all of areas here, so you can compute anything that areas knows about, uh, but at the same time, you added an interface that allows you to choose a specific context, specific, uh, um, specific accounts, which are CIA compliant by design. So what we have been doing here, for example, uh, we facilitate the choice of contexts. So for example, you can choose administrative regions here. This is the entirety of Spain, maybe it's a little much. Let's go a little bigger. And the system will uh, find the, 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 what is more appropriate from the zoom level. Now it's a, it's a part of France, maybe this is a little better. And then you decide uh, at which resolution, in which years, and in which uh, specific uh, times you want to compute, uh, to compute the, your, your, your results. And then click on the accounts you want. You can click on one or more or many. And at this point, the machine has decided uh, the context uh, and is building the model, and it starts computing the model. And the model you can look at and find it over here, the same that you saw before, but uh, this is a, a slightly different interface. So it's, uh, this is our uh, extent model. It's using a lookup table, and it's using this data, land cover, aridity, manual temperature, etc. It's not a complex model, so it's running kind of quickly. And uh, it runs in time, so you see these little clocks here, that means that these data are changing. So you have changing land cover data, changing uh, um, temperature data taken from Copernicus, etc. You see the, the time bar moving around here. And while the system is computing, you can start having a look at the data and how they change, and you can click around, you can download these things on raster maps, etc. So uh, I have absolutely no time to show you, about, to show you everything, but uh, at the moment, it was still a beta, beta stage. We have extent and condition accounts, uh, fairly well specified. The condition is mostly, for at the moment, just for forests. We're working on other um, components for grasslands and for marine environments. We have some uh, ecosystem service accounts, both uh, monetary and not. Uh, and we are expanding uh, this thing uh, uh, quite a bit. The last year has been mostly dedicated to, um, to working with the statistical office and actually understanding the incredibly complex conversation between uh, statisticians and uh, biophysical modelers. There are a lot of details that we had <laughs> no idea about. So we are working very seriously uh, on uh, making sure that those are handled properly. So now we have the simplest possible table. We have different kinds of tables. Those are very easy to continue computing here. For example, now that I have that, I can do the change matrix, which is probably more interesting from an accounting perspective. That should take uh, almost no time to compute. Here we go. So we can uh, see what has changed into what, etc. And these are the tables that, are, that we have built uh, uh, following the indication of the CIA technical committee. So they come out uh, in a mm, designed, uh, uh, compliant uh, CIA, CIA, uh, system, CIA paradigm. Now you can look at the data that have been used. Some of them still need a little bit of work, like the one at the top, but uh, 
that's the Copernicus data. You still need the documentation for that. But you can get uh, a, a very clear idea of all the data that have been used and actually download them if they are available, etc. cetera. Uh, you can get a list of figures, uh, changing uh, figures in time and space, etc. You can click on the bottom here and see the land cover in this case change. But most interestingly, the machine is intelligent and that intelligence means that in addition to building all the results that are raster maps, uh, it's also able to build uh, a documentation that is human readable. And this is not uh, entirely built by, by the machine, it's built by humans, but in components dedicated to each data set, to each part of the model, to each component, to each subcomponent. It's very useful in big models because it can be uh, quite complicated to put this thing together. And then you have your PDF that you can print, uh, and it contains all the disclaimers, it contains all the references, and uh, the figures and the results. And in the end, it, also, it will also contain the final table, which will be somewhere anyway. Um, so uh, that's basically all the time I have to talk about this. Uh, and uh, you're free to explore all this. So the part I personally like is not really the tool, again, for, uh, for the practitioners. But the fact that the practitioners and the public can use the same identical tool is free for everyone. And uh, it makes uh, the, you know, the conversation between governments and, their, uh, and the governees uh, a lot simpler, in my, in my opinion, particularly if it's uh, uh, dedicated not only to accounting uh, in the strict sense uh, and in the, in the precise sense that we're talking about today, but also to all the rest of the SDGs so or any kind of modeling, including hydrological modeling. We are doing a lot of work these days. So we already have uh, quite a bit, uh, everything figured out. Uh, uh, to add uh, water accounting, which is a much, much dif more difficult story. Also, it, it requires a lot more computation, but it's working quite nicely. And um, technically, you can put in areas anything you want. Uh, and it's not true that it's using global data. This is using Korean, for example, which is not uh, you know, global, but they're not local either because it goes for, for all of Europe. But if you have and you put ava make, make available to the system a local data for this particular region, you will see this small square computed with the local data and the rest computed with Korean. The machine is, a, is able to take two different models, even structurally different models, and put them together in different ways so that uh, you can ensure that the locality and the, the specificity of the data is always respected. And at the moment, we are in a learning experience with a different number of countries that are starting to use this system. Obviously, we are uh, working a lot uh, with the statistical office to make sure that that beta can, can go out at some point and all the accounts are compliant. I think we've, uh, at this point, we are fairly confident with, uh, I think, extent and uh, definitely condition as well. I think it's working very well as all this partial. We are expanding towards uh, many other ways. But the most important part is that for modelers, like for the Inca models that we are, uh, that Bruno was, uh, was, was starting to talk about, the, the thing for us is not that you use one model or areas. The thing is you can use areas to make your model better and to concentrate on the parts of your models that you actually know best. Uh, but you don't have to write uh, you know, the 90% of the code that goes with input outputs that, uh, to, to simulate the things you don't know about, but you don't have the money to hire an expert, etc. Every person uh, writes their own algorithm for, for their own concept, and everything else is left uh, to, its, to its proper inputs and outputs so that uh, in the end, uh, the integration builds the best model possible. And that's the very purpose of various as a modeling platform and as a modeling technology rather than a, a tool to solve a specific set of problems. So I think I've always, uh, I've already talked more than I could have. So thank you. Thanks, Ferdinand. So there is no excuse for every country to start doing and reporting on some of the Accounts. Uh, there is some tools already available. Okay, now we move. Uh, next speaker is Patrick Bogart. He's a senior researcher um, on natural capital accounting and working from CBS, the statistical office on Netherlands. Um, his talk is on the application of the Maya analytical tool by a national statistical office. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, welcome. Also, uh, nice to have this uh, introduction into a uh, map interface to uh, accounts. Um, although I have to, uh, have to say, as, as, as a statistical office, we are very um, reluctant now to, 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 to outsource the development of the accounts to an, uh, to an AI. So we, uh, we did it our, uh, ourselves, all the uh, 
setting up the, of the accounts. So, but we still use uh, tools like this also for um, to reach out to policy. So this talk has uh, three parts. I'm going to give a short introduction into uh, what is known as uh, the Maya Viewer, or now the Maya Analytical uh, Tool. Talk some about the applications and some uh, challenges that we uh, met uh, along the way. So the Maya um, Viewer, or, or tool, is also, um, uh, just as Arias, uh, a web-based uh, application in which we upload all the maps that we develop. Uh, so the main... Um, Characteristic is that we, as a statistical office, we develop maps of extent accounts of uh, ecosystem services in uh, in high um, in high detail, and that can be analyzed and viewed uh, through that uh, through the tool. So this example is in the, the extent account. Uh, on the right, you can see the uh, tremendous amount of detail because we use uh, high resolution topographic maps combined with other uh, sources. And based on that, um, extent accounts can be uh, generated from the tool. So you can select uh, an area and then have an uh, extent account being uh, generated. And one of the nice things is that it also allows for some condensation of, of, of the reporting because there are many ecosystem uh, types. In the Netherlands, we have about uh, 50. So, but in many cases, you're only interested in uh, characteristics on a higher level huh, because ecosystem classification is a hierarchical uh, system. And so this, uh, this tool now allows to have uh, first have a report on, uh, on the main levels that is here on, uh, on top. Um, language in Dutch, but, but that doesn't matter, I think, for this uh, explanation. Uh, and on the bottom, uh, it's more in, uh, in detail. So you can have, on the course level, have forest, and then expand it to all the different types of, uh, of forest, so dep depending on your, uh, on your needs. And it makes it very user-friendly, uh, we think. Second uh, example is uh, for crops. Um, and then, again, you can see the, uh, the amount of detail that we have, uh, because uh, there are official registries which, uh, which crop is being grown on which parcel, uh, uh, during a given uh, given year, so all the crop provisioning is uh, assigned to uh, to individual parcel. Uh, third example is a regulating service uh, pollination, uh, mainly provided by uh, by insects uh, living in natural habitats close to crops that require uh, pollination. And so on the right, you see in red the intensity of the pollination surface, and then you can see that it's uh, tapering off towards the, the northeast, eh, because then the habitats where the species live uh, are more farther away from the, from the crops. And based uh, on that information, uh, you can automatically uh, generate uh, accounts uh, of, of, of uh, surfaces. So this is an... an Simple example of uh, the amount of, of crops uh, being uh, produced by different uh, ecosystem uh, types um, throughout a period. So that's a bit of an overview of the basic functionality. So how now we apply this in our conservation with policy uh, makers? Um, there are a couple of, of, of attention points, I think. One is that uh, stakeholders often also explain that they require quite some uh, special detail. And one of the reasons for that is that because the, the national government, um, they only provide the constraints for policy development, uh, but most of the implementation is delegated to the provinces, uh, nitrogen, uh, biodiversity. And the provinces then delegate a lot of tasks to the uh, municipalities. Uh, these are detailed spatial planning, what is going to happen where, that's left to the municipalities. So in order to develop policy where you take natural capital into account, uh, you need information on the uh, municipality <coughs> level as well. And then, of course, there are some special regions which require some attention, uh, Natura 2000 region, natural parks, etc. A second type of application is that you can use the account to analyze uh, synergies and trade-offs in natural capital. Yeah? Can one ecosystem service also support another ecosystem uh, service? Uh, for instance, uh, extensive agriculture can also increase uh, nature-based uh, tourism in that area. Uh, but sometimes there are uh, trade-offs, then you can have one ecosystem service, but not the, the other one. So. Uh, and the, the, the Maya tool also allows uh, for that to have um, uh, synchronous uh, reporting on multiple ecosystem services at the same time. So that 
uh, that, that, that then allows for, for a simultaneous analysis of, of, of different surfaces. So. Second field of application is the well, the dissemination of, uh, of, of results. Because as a uh, National Statistical Office, we are obliged to, to do a lot of reporting and also to outreach to the uh, general public. So usually we do that with, with reports and statistical tables, um, yeah. Yeah, but also news items, uh, longer reports, and yeah, old-fashioned static maps. And tools like this also allows for a much more dynamic uh, way of uh, of of of, of uh, dissemination of the of the results. Uh, maps can now be uh, dynamic, and uh, s uh, statistics can be generated uh, on demand. So that also sounds very nice. But are there some challenges? Yes, of course. Um, one of them deal revolves about that uh, amount of spatial detail uh, because we like to have that spatial detail, but it often requires uh, local data. And although we develop our maps on this high resolution, and most of them on 10 meter resolution in the Netherlands, yeah, sometimes now also uh, two, uh, two and a half meters. So in theory, we deliver this. But in practice, the accuracy on that high level uh, depends on the data sources. Uh, use. Yeah, sometimes we use high resolution earth observation, and then we have data sources on, uh, let's say, 10 meter resolutions. But in other cases, we only have uh, national or regional lookup tables. Uh, for instance, crop provisioning, we have crop statistics on the <coughs> province level. And so that is then distributed uh, equally now along uh, on the parcels. And you can improve that with earth observation, but that's something that we still work on. So. The amount of detail is not always um, really there, and that uh, can cause some uh, problems. So here is an uh, now at least in Nels a very infamous uh, map on the national policies to reduce um, nitrogen emissions very close to uh, nature uh, nature reserves, and that 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 caused a, a lot of societal discussion over the last few months because maps like that will be interpreted as face value. People will look at individual pixels. And what happens in this map, for instance, is that um, yeah, the deposition on Natura 2000 areas has to be reduced. So they draw buffers of one kilometer around Natura 2000 uh, areas and say, well, there, there has to be a reduction. And although that was meant to be uh, just a general picture of what will uh, uh, needs to be done in the country. Huh? People looking at very specific Natura 2000 areas and say, well, yeah, but there is no agriculture close by, so this is just nonsense. And also people were complaining that uh, there is a lot of reduction uh, uh, in that area, but there you see that, that hole where you can peek through the, the colors and then see there is a power plant. You say, well, this is not taken into account. Yeah, but, well, uh, the map was only uh, was dealing with, with say the, the, the green parts of the country, not the built-up areas. So that was deliberate, but people did, did not see all the disclaimers. And you can have maps disclaimers, but they will still pixel peep. So a second uh, consistency is between um, what are the official statistics and what comes out of tools like this, because that is not always the same. And one of the things that you really have to uh, look uh, uh, at is, is, for instance, the regional boundaries. Uh, in previous versions, there was a much more coarser description of the province boundaries. And so you have a different area and different uh, uh, data coming out. Now, we have already fixed that. But also, um, the computations of, um, of, of which ecosystem contributes how much of uh, individual ecosystem services, uh, we, we use ArcGIS on our site uh, to, uh, with a uh, specific uh, algorithm to do that. But the, 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 the online tool uses different algorithm. And you have to make sure that they, have, they, they generate the same uh, results. Uh, otherwise, you have two different outcomes. Map projections also are, uh, are very difficult. Uh, we use a national uh, projection, uh, but uh, the, at least the European version of the tool then uses an, uh, a European projection. And for continuous fields like MPP, uh, the, you, you can reproduct uh, project uh, easily. But for more um, uh, nominal uh, maps like ecosystem type, uh, that is not so uh, uh, simple. And so that can also introduce artifacts in your post-processing. So you have to be really aware of, uh, of that. 
So we have now a special version of the tool with our Dutch uh, projection system. So to conclude, uh, the Maya viewer um, and the analytical tool uh, really um, uh, helps in uh, meeting the demands of uh, the various uh, stakeholders uh, for communication, for spatial detail, for uh, on-demand uh, uh, regional accounts uh, and more sophisticated uh, um, analysis. But still, there are some challenges uh, remaining on which we are currently working. Uh, uh, that uh, looking at the, uh, the spatial detail of the accounts, but also the, uh, the consistency between what is uh, calculated automatically of tools like this and what we officially publish as in statistical office. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I know that we are quite behind the schedule, but um, I think we need to give a few a, a, a few of time for questions. Uh, Sander is telling me that online there is some questions. Maybe should we take one or two here and then move to the online? Is anyone wants to have any questions to any of the speakers? Yeah, there is a couple of questions. Maybe I'm going to give. <laughs> yeah, so. Joaquin, can you? Yes, uh, thank you. A short question to Patrick uh, about the use of natural capital accounts by municipalities because, because I'm personally interested in it. Uh, can you give some examples how they use it and to support which type of decision making? Yeah, good question. At, at this moment we are uh, finding out what that, uh, that is. Um, but Municipalities, at least, they uh, are involved with, um, with, as I explained, spatial planning, especially for, for, for housing development, but also for parts of uh, what's called the natural forest strategy on where uh, there will be reforestation uh, uh, for the planning of recreation um, and uh, topics like this. Um, we do have more experience already on the province uh, level. Uh, where a lot of these uh, trade-offs, uh, especially between uh, agriculture and biodiversity, uh, I think common theme in, uh, in all of Europe. Yeah, and, and, and so policymakers are really interested in, uh, in, 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 especially in, in, in to what extent uh, measures they, uh, they take and, and uh, local policies they, uh, they set uh, if that uh, results uh, in improvements of uh, biodiversity. And that uh, at a local regional scale uh, or not. That that's one of the main uh, future application that are really interested in and working with us on that uh, topic. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Um, is there any question? No. So I'm handing to Sander. Thanks. Uh, there is a question from Daniela Ribeiro from SRC Zasu in Slovenia. That's a question for um, Ferdinando. Uh, and the question is very simple. Who can give input data to ARIAS? Does this have to be governments or can it be individuals or scientific? Is there some kind of policy? Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a wonderful question. I, I think I have a microphone. Uh, the, ev everybody in principle can. The point, the point is that, uh, I mean, you know perfectly well that uh, if you put uh, one of the problems of the internet in general is that there is a lot of information that is bad. So we cannot afford to have a very bad information. To, uh, to some extent, the machines actually rank information. And there are ways to do it based on, on, on several kinds of assessment. But obviously, they cannot distinguish uh, completely fake information from right information. So we need a level of control. So everybody can install a node of the system, or they can use uh, our own nodes uh, for uploading information, but they need to be certified, which means that uh, nothing is ever anonymous. Uh, and uh, also, the pathways of the information you add uh, to the system can be completely under control by the, by the person who owns the information. And actually, the paradigm that we try to, uh, to enable as much as possible is for every government and for every, every person, really, every institution that uh, adds information, which can be data, but it can also be models and algorithms uh, to the system uh, to be completely in control and to be in charge of their own information so that they have their own certificate, so we know who they are. 
uh, information can always be traced through full provenance records to their original uh, data, etc. And uh, uh, the, um, the people remain in charge of their information, remain the owners of that. For us, it's a very important thing, particularly when we start to involve uh, individual countries uh, that, uh, that actually want to develop their own accounts. They need to be in charge both of the data and the methodologies, and the system will adapt uh, based on the context uh, to whatever information has been, uh, has been uh, in identified as the right one to use. OK, thanks. Okay, so if there is no other questions, um, I think we're going to give a uh, final applause to all the speakers and we move on. Yes, thanks a lot. Let's come to the next uh, block here, which is about implementation of scientific findings in real cases and countries. First challenge to catch up with this Spanish timekeeping of the morning. <laughs> Let's see, but I guess we may run a little bit into the lunch break. I hope there is some flexibility here. Yes, no time to lose. Let's start with Eckhart Petri. I guess he's participating online. No, you're here. Sorry, yes. I guess most of you know him, at least have heard his name in the morning. It was mentioned once. He has been busy many years at Eurostat to develop indicators. And what I really like about his work is that he was already from the beginning considering the spatial perspective of indicators. So not only thinking in tables, like is done by many accountants, but really think about that these are all spatial phenomena we deal with. And I'm very curious to hear his talk, how we can implement this in the European Union. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. Is it okay if I speak without the headset? Yes, okay. So uh, I will briefly introduce what uh, is happening uh, in, in the domain of ecosystem accounting at EU level. Uh, I would like to give you an overview of the INCA project, although you have heard about it, so I will try to keep that very brief. And then the second part of my presentation will be about the forthcoming or current proposal for an EU regulation on ecosystem accounting, which uh, is now has reached a milestone in the summer and is now in the political discussions. So you've heard about the INCA project from Bruno and also others, uh, but uh, my professor once said, repetition is the mother of learning. What I would like to stress here is that the INCA was really absolutely essential in taking the decision to propose a regulation. So without the INCA project, we wouldn't have known that ecosystem accounting in the EU is feasible, and this was, uh, this was uh, a result of the success of the INCA project, in particular the success of the phase two, which uh, concluded in uh, last year. And it was also very important for us to have this interlinkage with the research community so that we have learned from each other and also to develop further the handbook on, on the standard. And having a standard is really, for us as a statistical office, absolutely essential. We want to develop the, the legal module against an existing statistical standard. So we are now entering the, we have entered the phase three of INCA, where we have uh, three main goals. The one that was uh, touched upon by Bruno is to, to continue the, the, the time series of accounts on services and extent. Then uh, the main element for us is the uh, development of the legal proposal. So we, although it is quite advanced, thanks to INCA, we still have a lot of open methodological questions where we also need the input from research. So we have to, to work together and we have to learn from you. And then there's also, because uh, not all member states are as advanced as, for instance, the Netherlands, there's a lot of open questions in the country, so we need to help them to get ready for the accounts, because unlike in other modules of the SEA, the accounts uh, haven't been tested with member states, for instance, through uh, voluntary reporting. So we have to catch up a bit on that, and we do this through development of tools, as we have heard. We are doing methodological work inside a task force, but also outside, and we give uh, grants to member states to uh, research certain aspects and they can of course also rely on the uh, support from research and we also give training courses to accountants in statistical offices and uh, in parallel we are developing like like in the previous presentation we also understand the importance of communication so this is 
our so-called Inca platform, where we, similar to the Maya tool, we, we are able to show ser ecosystem services in their spatial context, but also you can download the tables, supply and use tables, some of them even in monetary terms. And there's a lot of information about ecosystem, the, the development of ecosystem accounting in general. So now the, the main part of my presentation will be about this proposed, I would like to underline this, uh, legislation on ecosystem account. It's, it's one of three modules that uh, Eurostat has, or the Commission has proposed. The other ones are on subsidies and forest. Uh, in the preparation, we've heard that uh, the demand, the policy demand for ecosystem accounting is probably the highest, but at the same time, the statistical offices felt that the readiness of the European statistical system for ecosystem accounting is still, there's room for improvement. And uh, so we started the discussions with the member states uh, two years ago. And in, in June this year, the proposal from the commission was adopted by the commission. It's now entering the, uh, the co-decision between parliament and the council. And in parallel, we are going to launch a voluntary data collection that is always for us the preparatory step for, so that member states understand what they are expected to do and we understand what's the data like and we can feedback each other and this way the first actual reporting which will be required in 2026 with reference year 2024 if the proposal goes through as proposed, then the, the quality of the data will be very high from the, from the outset. Uh, this should give you an overview of the content of the proposal. So we will have three types of accounts, all in physical terms. So the monetary is left out for the moment. Um, so we will have the extent accounts that are expected to be reported every three years. And we have uh, proposed 12 types of ecosystems based on the mass classification that are mandatory. We would then encourage to also report at lower levels, but the mandatory ones are the ones that you can see in that table. And then building on that, we have the services account. So we are proposing seven services, provisioning, regulating, and then one cultural. Uh, in, as much as possible in line with the CIA, but sometimes we, we deviate a little bit and uh, this is uh, the result of, for instance, in the discussion with the task force that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then, as said, uh, the first reporting is expected in 2026 with reference year 24, so almost tomorrow in statistical terms. And then here an overview of the uh, condition indicators that we have uh, proposed. So it's, it's for a subset of the ecosystem types. So for five ecosystem types, we are proposing condition indicators. For settlements and other artificial areas, we propose to report green areas in cities and what is around, so the, uh, what we would call the urban sprawl around cities. And then the <coughs> concentration of PM, 2.5. Uh, then for cropland and grassland, uh, they have more or less the same indicators, so it's the soil organic carbon stock and uh, the farmland bird index. And then for forest and woodland, deadwood and tree cover density. And then the last one, which uh, where there's a lot of policy demand, but we are not quite sure yet how we want to, to develop this, is on the pressures from, from building basically on, 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 the, on the coast. We, we wouldn't be able to develop this uh, proposal without the, the help from member states mainly. So we have uh, set up a task force. And this task force has been very active, supported by also a contractor. You see the list of countries that are involved, plus our colleagues in DG Environment, the JRC, and then also the Environment Agency. Uh, and since uh, we, are, we have been working since June, June 21, and we have had 10 meetings. And this, thanks, thanks to COVID, online meetings are now more, more normal, and we, we, we wouldn't have been able to do this with physical meetings. So, but with the online meetings, we are able to move on at a very fast pace. So first, we, we focused on the development of the legal module so get, to get it ready for, for the adoption by the commission. And then uh, in parallel, but now its main area of work is the, to develop methodological guidance for all the accounts and all the indicators, which is really important because, like I said before, in many member states, there are worries about methodological gaps and we have to, to address these concerns and also 
get clarity ourselves because not everything, even in the CIA, not everything is very clear. And uh, as, as the more you go into the details, the more you realize there are still many open questions and we have to just address these questions through guidance to the member states. And then we, in general, we are also looking at, uh, at accounting, so to make the, uh, the accounts uh, compatible with the, all the, with the standards so that they are methodologically robust, in particular with the CEA main central framework and uh, national accounts. So what we are doing, we are developing guidance internally, and then at some point we say they are ready, and then we seek the, uh, the feedback from, from all the member states and other members of our working groups. And then after incorporating and processing the feedback, we give uh, the guidance to a group of countries that have volunteered for testing. And this will be, sta this will be starting in, at the beginning of next month, month for the extent accounts, for instance. So we are looking forward to that, to receive feedback from countries when they are actually applying the guidance for the extent account, how does it work? You have access to all the documents that this task force is uh, discussing and uh, drafting and the link is in the slides that you will hopefully get after this presentation or after this conference. And in addition, in the member states and Eurostat, we are, we are preparing, we are getting ready. So like I explained, there's testing. We are inviting, uh, we are going to invite also countries to test the uh, guidance notes on ecosystem services and conditions once they are ready, so probably in 23. We will uh, set up voluntary data collections like we always do with new um, statistical areas before the legislation will enter into force and then we give money and grants to, to NSIs to develop their national machinery for delivering data to us. So this is uh, my quick overview. Uh, I've included some references so at the top you can have a look at the draft regulation and also read the cover note how we have justified why ecosystem accounting should be a, a statistical regulation in the EU, then you can have a look at the INCA platform. Uh, there's also the link to the Circa BC side of the task force. And then you can, if you want to have a general overview of how environmental accounts are, are being done and how they are evolving in the European statistical system, there's also some uh, information on uh, at the last link. So this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you very much also for saving us five minutes of our precious time. We do the same like in the session before that we do the questions in the end and have all the presentations first. Next speaker will be myself. Good. One slide fits all. Uh, this is work has been done in work package three of Maya. Uh, by myself and Sabine Lange from Leibniz University Hannover and then uh, Fernando and Adrian who also in the room from the University King uh, Juan Carlos in Madrid. I would just quickly tell what has been the progress in the last four years where this Maya project was running in the different uh, member states related to NCA. Then we will check what are solutions for problems that we faced and what are the lessons that we learned from this approach. And then we will propose, so this is a really first draft, this is really pioneering work, we will recommend some steps uh, which could be used for successful implementation and mainstreaming of national capital accounting. This is our beloved table of progress in the member states, so I will not bore you of the with the different tasks we did in uh, Maya in this work package. This was uh, one of the final tasks. In the beginning, we had this table with different member states, the 10 countries that participate in Maya, and then the different... Uh, core accounts we have here, and in the beginning this table was quite empty. We also had that in the project proposal, maybe this was one reason why we get the funding, that there was not so much progress in the member states, and now you can see here different colors. You have in green are the different accounts in the countries that were supported by Maya, that get whatever support, technical support, financial support, whatever. Uh, dark green is the national scale accounts, and in a bit more light green are subnational accounts on the subnational scale. Then you see in gray are other accounts which took place without any support of Maya. So this is, I think, quite a great success of mainstreaming natural capital accounting across Europe. You see many countries got lots of support. Others were a bit more independently working or had the accounts already ready. So this is quite something where we can say, okay, Maya was useful to implement this and to give support to the different member states. What were solutions? Uh, 
problems that we faced and that were identified when we were talking to the member states. Two key issues were lack of policy support, which is of course also related to uh, lack of funding, and then lack of technical skills and knowledge for people to doing the tasks that are related to the different accounts. So what we figured out, we did a lot of interviews, talked to people and thought what could be points to get over these uh, issues, like policy support, of course awareness raising is always good, then also appropriately disseminate the results of accounting what they can be used for, improve the understanding about accounting, what is the context, that it's not only about commodification of nature, but it's really a useful tool for planning, for management, whatever, that it really has high relevance for improved decision making, and make sure that this is not a black box where some data and numbers are coming out in the end and nobody really knows how they were generated, so really make this a bit more clear what's going on there. The national meetings, I think, were really a key pillar of disseminating the outcomes of the different approaches in the countries. And then we had very intensive discussions with relevant stakeholders, so Work Package 3 mainly, some support from Work Package 2 came also in. We had regular meetings offering our help and had regular workshops and online meetings where several people of our Work Package did this, disseminated this, and uh, together with the webinars that were organized by Maya, so this was really good point of knowledge sharing and making clear what it's about and that it's not rocket science in all parts, but some things really are clearly understandable by majority of, of people there. Then, of course, the cooperation, the communication is very important. Get into discussion with the agencies and ministries also, convince them why it's a good idea to do accounting, how they can contribute and how the results can be used, and, of course, statistical offices in each country uh, that participated in Maya, because they have the numbers, they have the data, and have to produce something useful out of this. We did many surveys, so I think many of you were contacted several times to track this progress in Maya. Here are two examples of this survey. You see the 10 countries of Maya, and then here is uh, how they self-assessed what the lack of policy support, how was it uh, yeah, solved in the years that Maya was running there. So there's some, we got several answers. There's a devia standard deviation there, and you see on this scale from uh, 1 to 10 that most countries assessed there was some progress, but of course in different levels. We did uh, identify what is the biggest challenge. Is still that member state representatives ask uh, or are lacking a clear mandate. Who has to do it? Of course, this mandate also means that there's time and resources dedicated to do this job. Nobody will do this in the free time usually. And of course, have defined responsibilities across these different national authorities. So that it's not moving forward from environmental ministry to agencies to statistical office. That's a clear mandate. This is your task. You get contributions from this person. And also, as I said, dedicate respective resources to, to make this uh, going. The next key challenge, there were many more challenges. I will just present two challenges here. Was the technical skill and knowledge lack? Of course, these pilot projects were very good to really test things and get all this huge uh, scientific knowledge base and database that is there running and bring it to the member state. Of course, we were following the SEA uh, work that was do done there and lots of literature review to really figure out what is there and what can be used. Again, personal discussions were really important to have this and also lots of workshops, the webinars, as I said already, and yeah, including different expertise including this economic expertise, but especially also ecological expertise for the biophysical accounting, participate of Maya, participation of Maya members in expert meetings on an international level and national level, and building technical stuff, really training them in GIS modeling, remote sending, different forms of valuation, uh, where we also combined this with existing national research grant funding for the pilot testing. So this was quite something like Maya as a coordination and support action doesn't have sufficient resources to carry out own research, but then really link up with existing other projects on the different levels, EU and national levels, really helped us to implement the things. Then again, a uh, result of this survey across uh, these member states, and here it's related to technical uh, skill improvement. This looks even a bit better than the uh, lack of uh, policy support. You see there's really... Most people really are said nobody will give a 10, of course, because we always need some, some buffer to, progress, uh, to improve. But still, this is quite a nice result uh, that there really has been progress in the last four years. Based on all the experience in Work Package 3 and in the other uh, Maya contribution that we learned, we gave this uh, stepwise approach. I know that commission people really love this clear bullet points and stepwise approaches, how to implement this. So this is our proposal from Work Package uh, 3 
what would be steps for successful implementation and mainstreaming of natural capital accounting. We identified eight steps. So the first thing is to really identify why we are doing this. Not doing science for science or art for art or whatever, but really know what is the relevant question behind the accounting exercise that we are doing. Of course, it's nice to collect all these numbers and to have them just in case you need them. But if you have a clear mandate, a clear question that needs to be solved, then this is quite, uh, I think it's much more focused, your, your accounting exercise. Aligns this, of course, with policy priorities and uh, also business priorities in member states and institutions and really do this uh, or start at least for specific ecosystem types. So don't try to solve all the world's problems in all ecosystem types for all services, for all questions at the same time, but really start maybe focused in some ecosystem type and then develop this further in the, in the future. The next one, of course, identify and involve uh, suitable amount and quality of stakeholders. Really create this community of practice and networks that make people to collaborate, link up with the statistical agencies and respective scientists from different disciplines, and again, these workshops and meetings. We had a tough time, of course, in Maya due to COVID, that many things had to take place online. So no too many in-person meetings, but still I think we managed quite well to bring the different communities together. And of course, link this up to European directives and regulations that uh, we really can contribute something to. Data, of course, we heard a lot about data already this morning. So this is really something to collect this data, make them available, open access. So no one will be willing to pay a uh, crazy amount that are asked sometimes to get some special data, so really collect them from different platforms, make them available in an easy format uh, to different partners and people who would like to use them. Then select appropriate methods. The tiered approach is quite nice. I learned two new uh, ways of this, so I think I collected four different ways how to define tiers in science, so we really make, may need some mainstreaming of tiered approaches, but we will see how we do this. But it's a good idea. The key message of tiered approaches is we have all kinds of methods, different complexity, and in the end, if you want to answer these complex questions that we have, you need to combine them. So there will be no model that sits all of them. Maybe Arius has this approach that they want to solve all the questions, but I really think that we need to combine all kinds of methods and approaches to answer the questions that we will identify in the, in the first step. And of course, harness what's there, existing projects like the Mars Working Group or Keep Inca, whatever is there. Again, cooperate with the statistics, statisticians and government bodies. Fifth one is uh, test these methods and data that you have. Perhaps also challenge the persons that you identify here in pilot accounts. This was quite useful also in Maya, I think. We learned a lot by this to really bring this into application. And then, of course, appropriate dissemination and communication of the results. So I think not many people uh, beyond statistics will read tables, 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 numbers, numbers, numbers. So I think maps are a very good way, appropriate figures, I think there's a lot of science communication development now. We use different channels and really uh, communicate these results in a format that's understandable by the, by the question and by the target group that you have here. So this is something I guess science really still has to learn a lot. But of course also stakeholders have to learn to read a bit more complex things that not everything can be aggregated into one number in the end. So there's a lot of science policy, business interfaces I think really has to be, have to be served a bit better still in the future. But uh, there's a lot of development going on. Then integrate this into official national statistics. This is, of course, a mandate also from the biodiversity strategy that this has to be integrated uh, ecosystem accounting data into national and uh, supranational uh, reporting systems. Well, I'm really curious to see how this will go in the next year, all the data and methods we produce, how they will be taken up on different levels. And then, of course, finally, implement this in policy and decision-making uses on different levels, your disseminated results, uh, to really make a difference. As I said, not just collect the numbers because we have to collect them, but really know why we are doing this. But of course, you can imagine this is not a one-directional uh, eight steps, but it's the kind of cycle. And if you figure out that your results are not really useful for improving decision-making, then you may think about again to go through this again and maybe identify different methods and different people, different data sets. So this is, in a nutshell, what we propose after this Maya experience and lots of context to these 10 countries that were involved. Think about it, whether you agree or not. Uh, I think it's quite useful to guide people. Of course, you can also jump into different steps. Uh, you don't have to start, obviously, maybe if it's clear what your purpose is and if your methods are clear, you can start at a different step. To conclude, 
we can really conclude that there has been significant, significant developments in these member states that were participating in Maya, of course also in other countries, but those we didn't track in the project. Many member states developed first pilot accounts or additional pilot accounts. They were not initially foreseen, so Maya really forced them or supported them to have at least one additional account. Uh, and this is really something also this link up with the national agencies and statistical offices was quite a success of Maya. And the key really is this exchange of knowledge, continue this awareness raising and really uh, capacity building, I think very really strong pillars of the, of the Maya project and to better implement the things in the different countries. And yeah, I think these people that we interviewed really appreciated a lot that we have this quite transparent process of knowledge sharing and methods sharing. And yeah, we really have to figure out how we can continue this also beyond Maya uh, when the project ends, that the steps we were taking was our start. We are quite far already, but we really need to continue and see how we can, can take this, uh, have a continuation in these developments. And as we said, based on the experience we collected there, we would propose these eight steps uh, for successful implementation. With this, thanks a lot. I saved one and a half minutes. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'm ready for questions in the end then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next speaker will be Steven from Vito, senior, senior researcher there, very busy in environmental economic, economic valuation and urban areas, whatever, and involved in many projects. I think he's well known enough to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I uh, will give you a brief overview of the natural capital accounting activities that we do in Belgium. Uh, I uh, put this pr presentation together with uh, Merlein, also from Inbo. A uh, bit of a project context. Uh, when we started Maya, uh, we actually produced no accounts. Uh, uh, it's because of the project that we were able to produce some pilot accounts. And we also had uh, some uh, co-financing uh, by the uh, Environment and Spatial Planning Department, uh, which is always interesting because uh, funding is also a sort of validation, let's say. And uh, we also had a, a Eurostat project where the uh, pilot accounts that we produced were uh, studied more in-depth and uh, a validation exercise was performed. Uh, we produced several pilot accounts, of course the extent, which makes sense, which is the starting point of the other accounts. We worked on wood provision, uh, global climate regulation, water flow regulation, and more specifically infiltration, uh, and we also worked on amenity and more specifically health impacts due to nearby ecosystems. We pr pr produced some maps and some biophysical and monetary indicators. Now to start, we already had, let's say, a big... Uh, head start, uh, because we uh, had quite some uh, experience in mapping and assessing ecosystem services. I always uh, use the left graph in uh, the presentation, which is a result of the Esmeralda uh, project. Uh, Benjamin is good in ranking countries. And uh, this was the first assessment, and I al always use that one because Belgium is on top. But to be honest, uh, the middle graph is uh, the final evaluation, and Belgium lost a couple of places, but uh, no worries, we're still uh, in a good shape. Uh, so we. Uh, had some research projects, uh, a state of the environment report, let's say, where we mapped and assessed ecosystem services, a very extensive exercise with a, little, a lot of individual reports, a lot of expert consultation. And we also have some online tools to support uh, spatial planning and uh, to assess ecosystem services uh, due to the impact of ecosystem services due to uh, land use change. Uh, so for us, Natural capital accounting was a bit new. Uh, how do we go from ecosystem service to natural capital accounting? Of course, the, the tables, uh, supply use tables, which is a, a new concept, uh, was back then a new concept for us. But also, more importantly, the trends. Uh, we need to monitor trends in time, some sort of ex post evaluation versus what we are used to do, and that's project appraisal predict the impact of projects on ecosystem services. So data consistency and time is a very important uh, issue. Uh, 
And also, we, need, we needed to involve statistical offices, uh, which, which was a bit new to us because we're used to working with environment administrations. And we understand now that the prior priorities that they set are a bit different uh, compared to what environment administrations uh, want. Uh, so we did a big user requirements analysis. Uh, there was a core group uh, on natural capital accounting composed, five to ten people in, uh, dispersed across different administrations who really are, let's say, the front runners and what we call the white knights to uh, uh, promote the flag of the natural capital accounting in uh, the different administrations. We had a very big uh, stakeholder workshop uh, with approximately 100 people to discuss pilot accounts, and we set up individual working groups per individual account to uh, really uh, move ahead on methodologies, on use. And uh, I added some important statements, uh, also from the statistical office, good to hear, that they want statistics to be used, of course. The demand-driven assessments are quite key. And also that the users are looking for standardization, some sort of central knowledge base where they can find information on ecosystem service. Because in the past, you, had a, you have a lot of research projects, but once the project is over, the knowledge disappears and nobody still knows uh, what to use, what, uh, what to do in the future. So continuation is a, a very uh, important aspect. And there are also, of course, different needs for individual accounts uh, for, from the administrations working on water, climate, health, uh, and they all have a long tradition environmental, in environmental modeling that's also not to be forgotten. So the pilot accounts, extent asset, and some ecosystem service accounts. Uh, briefly, some input on some outcomes on the extent account. So we uh, we have different types of land use maps available. So we selected what we see as the most appropriate map based on available ecosystem types, accessibility, of course, but very important, of course, the frequency of updates. Uh, do we know that this map will be still there in the future so that we can derive trend and accuracy and scale? So in the end, we used the land use file Flanders, which has three yearly updates at 10 by 10 meter resolution. And the map is a combination of different maps. Uh, you have information on agricultural land and the exact crops uh, that are being grown there, but similar to uh, what was presented for the Netherlands. We have a very uh, accurate uh, map on residential types, which is updated, let's say, on a, on a monthly or half-yearly basis. Uh, we have a habitat map, and we have what we call the green map, uh, but which we mainly use for the presence of small green elements in agricultural landscapes and all sorts of... Yeah, okay, we're ready. Um, there was, after we presented the extent account, there was uh, a validation performed by IMBO. So what they did is they evaluated more than 3,000 points by 10 evaluators on the basis of aerial photographs, additional information. And they studied land use 2013 and 2016 and land use change. <laughs> Okay, artificial intelligence, probably, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the reference years are quite old. I'm, I'm talking, yeah, the exercise that we did was, let's say, at the beginning of the Maya project. So we're talking four years ago, the data before. So three yearly updates, uh, so that's why 2016. And to my surprise, the overall accuracy of the maps was 60% in 2013 and 72% in 2016 which I find a bit low, uh, because yeah, for me, a land use map was a given uh, <laughs> until this val val validation exercise. But you still have uh, some large differences. And more specifically, the land use change, we were right in half of the uh, observed changes. So that's uh, also, uh, yeah, for me, a, sh a shocking experience. So the main issues there were, were, were the interpretation of aerial data, this green map, and also a mix of reference years in the habitat map. So the statement that was made by INBO that the e uncertainty in the ecosystem classification is too large to detect short-term trends uh, or to make statements about ecosystem changes. Uh, this is a map that was, uh, or a graph that was uh, made by people from INBO, which I always like. And if you look at the green bars, uh, uh, this is uh, an evaluation of the ecosystem map. 
and the green bars. Uh, the ecosystem map is based on uh, yeah, observations on the ground. Uh, and if you look at the green bars, uh, the, it says what's the year of origin of observation in the 2018 map. And uh, you see a lot of green bars 2017, 2016, but also still some bars here. 2000, 1998, and if you look at the red map, the, the red bar, so the 2016 map which we used, these original dates are more or less centered around 2000. So if we look at the map of 2016, it's not actually 2016, but more or less 2004 on average. And if we look at 2018, it's more or less 2015 on average, which is a, of course a very important fact to uh, have in mind. So what we did is uh, we did some improvements uh, and we tested and validated this. We replaced some input maps, but in the end, we yeah we must be fair. The major challenge uh, that we are not really able to really uh, derive trends still remains. We could only only make some smaller improvements, especially on the ecosystem types. Uh, the lower you go in the levels, let's say level one, level two, level three classification, the more uncertain it becomes. And uh, yeah, that's uh, a very important uh, fact. So we also uh, uh, set up some supply use tables. Uh, it's in Dutch, I'm afraid, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to briefly mention some things on the, the health aspect that we looked at. There will be a paper published on this, uh, I guess, in the One Ecosystem uh, Journal. So we'll, we looked at health benefits, so the avoided physical and mental illness effects due to nearby green space, where we define green space as, let's say, all green areas uh, nearby, parks, forests, but also agricultural land. Exposure means you have contact with nature. And it's also important to realize that this benefit that we assessed is in addition to other uh, benefits, for instance, air filtration, because we also look at other uh, types of health impact. And we look at also the monetary benefits, where we estimated the avoided healthcare costs, uh, productivity gains, because you have less absenteeism at work, and also we considered uh, some welfare gains. So we uh, set up a green exposure indicator, a very detailed assessment of the share of green areas, and what is the distance people have to uh, walk or uh, uh, drive to get to certain green areas, how many areas are nearby. We have precise information on the place of residence, uh, detailed the end use map and this consistent interpretation. Uh, of course, yeah, this changes over time still is a challenge and we, we realize that the, the green indicator that we use is quite rough. It's not a really an assessment of the quality of the green eh, because we don't know accessibility, what type of facilities are there which also makes it difficult for a policymaker to link their efforts yeah, to the outcome of uh, the account. And that's always uh, very important to have in mind. Uh, those response relationships which say, okay, what's the relationship between uh, exposure to green and specific health impact? Uh, we did an extensive literature review, especially the mental health part is, is quite important. And especially also in a, in a Belgian context where a lot of people uh, take antidepressant medication, mental health is a very important thing uh, to consider and also something that attracted quite a lot of uh, attention. So monetary valuation, you have different beneficiaries, different types of valuation methods. Uh, I'm not going to in the welfare versus exchange value type of discussion, but yeah, we avoided healthcare cost and avoided absenteeism are very useful indicators, which are typically done in a, in a cost of illness uh, type of approach, which we applied in this assessment. So uh, in the end, uh, it is an important benefit, so this, I heard, numbers of 2% of GDP. Uh, and we, when we also do this type of calculations, it's mainly the cultural uh, ecosystem services that largely dominate the monetary estimation. Uh, we find health, of course, very important. So that's also why uh, we uh, uh, yeah, put a high value on it, and it's, it's dominating the monetary uh, valuation methods, uh, monetary valuation uh, accounts. Um, we did a valid validation on this, uh, a large stakeholder analysis with an online questionnaire. Of course, you cannot validate uh, 
health impacts based on real life data because it, it's not there. It's different compared to what you can do with an extent account. And some major conclusions were to update those effect relationships because it's, it's yeah, it's in a sense a transfer from a, a, another country and to set up our own those effect relationships and yeah, to also uh, improve data on healthcare expenditures, loss of labor and productivity losses. And uh, the health department, let's say, is also uh, actually working on this type of uh, activities. So what's next? Uh, we noticed that yeah, we had Maya, we had a, another project, and it created, let's say, a, an, an uprising of activities on natural capital accounting. But now these research projects are ending. So the question is, what will we do in the upcoming years? How will these accounts very, uh, evolve further? And that's not very clear. Uh, we, we see that the core group on natural capital accounting at the moment is not very active. Uh, people change jobs, for instance, so which makes it a bit difficult. And there is a bit of lack of framework and ownership. And we hope, of course, that the European legislation will create this framework and the necessary ownership to keep developing uh, the accounts. However, it's not always so negative. Uh, there are still a lot of initiatives ongoing for individual accounts in specific policy domains. Uh, we know that there is a lot of interest to more incorporate ecosystem services in spatial planning. There are also a lot of very practical applications where it is actually being done. Uh, we notice also climate adaptation policy, which is a, a very important driver here for municipalities. There, for instance, we, we look at local climate regulation, how ecosystems contribute to local climate regulation and what the impact is on health. Uh, we use process-based models uh, for this. And also health policy, the health policy perspective, also linked to local climate, for instance, is really uh, taking up epidemiological studies, what uh, previous heat events uh, caused uh, towards uh, mortality events, and they are really monitoring this uh, in time, which is, of course, very interesting. What are for us some lessons learned? Of course, validation. Trends we feel mm, we are not really there yet. So to really say uh, we see uh, the amount of natural capital decrease, increase because of this, this and this, I don't think we are able to do this at this moment. Of course, there is an importance of legislation and ownership, but yeah, the ambition needs to be to go, go beyond tick box production of accounts by statistical office. So involving the environmental administrations is, is especially in a Belgian context very important. Also because yeah, the institutional context is different. We don't have uh, a Dutch statistical office with, with 2,000 people, or I don't know how many you are. <laughs> but it's a small entity. They need to get the data from the other administrations, so involving them is, is, uh, is very important. And this also means that you have to take into account what how they work. And they already have models in place. They already have methodologies. If you really want their support and want to involve them on the longer term, you also need to uh, take into account the methodologies that they have and not come with something new and something completely different because they will not accept it. So we need to look into what they are doing and how we can improve how ecosystems are taken into account in their uh, efforts and their existing modeling exercise. And also something that surprised me in, in, in the entire pilot accounts is that how ecosystems are currently approached in different policy domains is very rough. Uh, because it's, let's say, from a carbon perspective, the contribution of ecosystems in, a, in an entire carbon account is very limited. I think it was half a percent. They don't spend a lot of efforts and really estimating accurately what, what the contribution of the ecosystems is. So, and the same goes for water policy and so on and so on. So there is a, a knowledge gap which this community still can fill, is my feeling. Thank you very much, Steven. <laughs> and I'm sure we will come up with a new tracking system in Selina where Belgium can catch up again and ah, yeah. can up in the higher top 10 of countries. Our next presenter is online, it's Marco Vitas, uh, Vitasalu from the 
uh, Süke, and there he is a research professor, marine ecologist by background, but now dealing a lot with climate change, biodiversity, and planning issues. And yeah, he will introduce us into the pilot of marine ecosystem accounting in Finland. I hope the technique will work. So, Marco, then please go ahead. Yes, we hear and see you. Excellent. Yes, thank you very much, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to give this online. Uh, I'm giving the talk on behalf of uh, a small Finnish group in Syke, Elina Virtanen, who has been the main author and, and uh, uh, technical geek in, in the project uh, modeling of uh, ecosystem habitats, uh, species, whatnot. Susanna Jernberg, who is uh, an ecosystem service specialist, Soile, who is uh, an environmental economist, and myself. Next, please. Uh, briefly, contents uh, traditionally come from background uh, goals and approach, then a few points on challenges and solutions we had, and then uh, methods, key results, and conclusions. Next, please. And very simply, uh, the goal of the whole exercise was just to define, describe, and also quantify ecosystem extent and condition. And this may sound trivial, but especially in the marine environment, this is not. And uh, um, uh, first of all, how, how do you define ecosystem extent? Uh, you can think that, okay, all of the Baltic Sea is an ecosystem and you can describe its condition. It's uh, well known and that it's uh, generally quite poor. But then the, there is a lot of variation, of course, uh, between basins and, and when we go into the uh, coastal areas, uh, then there is even more variation. And, and then you need to decide what is your object of, of observation, and uh, that is the extent, and then decide how do you define condition for this specific ecosystem or, or any type of area. Uh, for instance, on my background, you can see a beautiful uh, uh, eelgrass, Bed. And now, if you assume that this type of organism is, is putting up some services for uh, other organisms, uh, mainly invertebrates and, and, uh, uh, and fish, then, then it might be providing some ecosystem services for, for humans as well. And, and then it's of interest to define what is its condition and how large areas do these species occupy. Next, please. So um, very simply, again, uh, the approach is uh, to take either species or defined habitats. And in this case, we are speaking of uh, EU habitats, directive habitats that are listed in, in the directive Annex 1 and then uh, many species that we have in the Finnish sea area, and then try to determine its, the, the, their condition, both for habitats and species. And, and um, many of you probably know that uh, many coastal areas in Europe are, are very much eutrophied, and especially in our waters, we, we do have big problems with uh, algal blooms on the right hand side uh, picture, you can see a conspicuous blue green algal bloom, which is smothering the water and also causing uh, nutrient, uh, uh, nutrients leaking in the water. And, and uh, there is a vicious circle of, of, of eutrophication due to uh, external loading of nutrients from human activities and then internal loading from, from the sediments. But then, on the other hand, uh, humans are also causing many other types of uh, issues for, for our sea areas, including habitat degradation, and that is the key point of my talk. 
today. Next. Uh, so after uh, defining the extent and condition, uh, the, it's of interest to determine the links between species and habitats and ecosystem services. And that is done in another work that I'm not going to explain today. But uh, in the end, all this information provides uh, us uh, information on the capacity of habitats and species to supply ecosystem services, which then can be monetized or otherwise valued if, if necessary and uh, producing the uh, EA. But for the challenges, next please. Uh, I was mentioning uh, the, the very complex archipelago. I, I'm sorry to say, but this exercise would be very much easier on the Belgium coast. And uh, <laughs> Uh, this type of archipelago and coastal area that we we have creates a lot of complexity in both the ecosystem and also the provision of ecosystem services and uh, many challenges for its accounting. Next, please. So we have done it the hard way. Uh, Benjamin mentioned uh, that it's not reasonable to collect crazy amounts of data, but this is exactly what we have done. We have from uh, 2004 had this uh, inventory program called VELMU in Finnish, the Finnish inventory program for underwater marine diversity. And we have collected uh, about 170,000 spatially explicit observations from across the whole Finnish sea area. And this information of species and habitats and also we do have a lot of information on, on the water quality and uh, different types of uh, human pressures on, on the ecosystem. And, and this information can be used to uh, get the information needed for today's presentation. Next. And next. First, the ecosystem extent. As I said, um, there are uh, species that might be of interest in this context, but then uh, all these species are living in some kind of an uh, environment or habitat. Next. And as I said, in here, in this context, we use the, the EU directive habitat and it's uh, different uh, uh, Annex 1 habitats. And uh, uh, the, you probably can't see, but the, the brown ones are estuaries, then there are uh, dark green, are boreal Baltic narrow inlets, and uh, light green are large shallow inlets and bays, then uh, the yellow ones are sandbanks, and then all the small blue ripple are reefs. They are not, of course, coral reefs, but just uh, hard rock bottom uh, that is uh, serving as, as, a, as, as a substrate for certain species that like to sit on these rocky substrates like blue mussels or uh, brown algae and other stuff, while uh, aquatic plants and, and different uh, species with roots will be settling in in the soft sediments. Next, please. And uh, that was the habitat part. But then we have the species and uh, using these 170,000 observations and all the background information on environment and human pressures, we can put up spatial distribution models. And we have done that for 200, uh, about 200 species, and, and that describes quite adequately the communities that we have. And note here, and, and this uh, picture here shows a model for bladder rack, and, and uh, it shows the niche or the, the probable distribution area of the species. And note that these models already consider generic pressure such as eutrophication, but they don't uh, involve the abrupt changes 
caused by human activities. And uh, I'm going to explain what this means. But then uh, after setting up these uh, uh, species models, we go on looking at the such abrupt pressures. Next, please. And go on defining the ecosystem condition. Thank you. And data on all human activists on sea it can, can, can be uh, determined using uh, public data, satellite images, and, and uh, different analyses that we have done. There have uh, 150,000 sites identified where human activities take place. Uh, these, these could be, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, construction of coastal areas or, or dredging and, and this type of things that are actually causing direct habitat loss and therefore uh, also degrading the condition of species and habitats. Next please. So uh, why we speak of dredging uh, it might be a small thing in very, uh, various areas in, in Europe, but in Finland it, it is a big thing, of course, due to the ship fairways, but especially due to the summer cottages that uh, a large part of the population does have. And they are done uh, with these small scale uh, ent enterprises and equipment and, and uh, done to enable the small boats entering the, the small harbors in front of uh, the summer cottages. Next. And this uh, picture shows uh, a very tiny area in the southwest Finland uh, seen on the green map as a red box. And the scale here on the right hand corner of, of the larger in, in insert is five kilometers. And all these red dots are actually small scale dredgings that have been done in this particular co coastal archipelago area. So you can see that basically all of the coasts have been dredged and uh, well, the, the actual area of, of each of the dredgings might be small, but then you, you have a certain buffer zone where the, the siltation and other effects are, are uh, being uh, transferred into the nearby areas. And that, that is a major problem in our waters. Next, please. So uh, that was just an example. Uh, we have uh, collected information on all activities that cause direct loss to habitats. And uh, next. And then determined the, this area uh, from the spatial information collected. And uh, you can see a map uh, of the capital city area and uh, some 50 kilometers east and west of it. Uh, 30, 30 kilometers east and west of that, and all yellow areas. And land, land is gray and uh, sea is black, and all yellow areas are the destructed habitats, habitat loss and severe disturbance of the coastline. Next, please. And in addition to this direct loss, we have also determined the level of disturbance and taken the severe disturbance that ha have, may, may be caused by different activities into account. Next, please. Yes, key, key result, only one slide. Uh, thank you. We made this calculation where the EU habitat directive annexes were taken total uh, area 80 uh, of or total sea area is 81000 km uh, square kilometers extent of EU habitats is 500 uh, 5477 kilometers and extent of 
totally degraded habitats of them was 162 square kilometers. So uh, extent of habitats not degraded was 5,300 and, and uh, that can be considered quite good uh, condition, but on the other hand, uh, uh, they, we only accounted for the direct loss of habitats here, and, and that, that is a quite severe state of ecosystem condition. Okay, this, this was all from my side. Uh, thank you. Conclusions, uh, potential of the marine ecosystem can be determined from habitats and species uh, that are not severely degraded, and this allows to set targets for ecosystem condition and safeguarding ecosystem services. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, thanks a lot, Marco. Just in time, 15 minutes, perfect, and nice background indeed. Then we come to the next speaker, last one of this block, which is Fernando Santos from the University King uh, Juan Carlos in Madrid. And he will t take us to Spain. So we move from the northeast of Europe to the southwest. And uh, yes, okay. take us yeah. to Spain, please. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I'm going to give you an overview of all the work that we have done within Maya in ecosystem accounting. Um, our approach has been really much focused on the implementation of the SIA EA guidance, so I'm going to focus basically on, on what we did following the SIA approach. Um, I would like to acknowledge also the work from Adrian, which is here in the room, which he, actually he was uh, doing his PhD and he has done most of the hard work on, on all these accounts that you will see. Um, as Steve was saying, in the case of Belgium, we, in, in Spain, we have had a lot of experience on, on ecosystem assessment and ecosystem services mapping since 2010 when we started our national ecosystem assessment. But we did have a, quite a big challenge on how to use all this information into the accounting framework or into our accounting world. So it was quite of a... Uh, difficult on, on terminologies, concepts, and, and methodologies that we have to use and adapt all this existing information. So that was kind of uh, the main challenge that we have to face. So we didn't start from zero, from scratch, but it has to transform all this information into the accounting framework. It was quite of, of, of a challenge. Um, in the case of Spain, for Maya, uh, we have representative from the Ministry of Ecological Transitions and the National Institute of Statistical Office of Spain. And from the research, we have us in university and uh, Alejandro and his team from the Spanish National Research Council, which were working and has a long experience in working on accounting in Andalusia and forest accounting in Andalusia. So we have a lot of discussions at the beginning on, on how to transform all this information into the new SIA framework. One of the main starting points is exactly to define what is your accounting area, what is your ecosystem classification systems and data sources that you have for that. Um, well, we have here that there is a lot of guidance and, and global data sets that you can use, but it's not really easy to transform all this or following just a step by step approach and develop all these um, maps. And so it really takes a lot of time on defining what are your classification system, where do you get the data from. So it, it, it took us almost two years of adapting and discussing all these issues on how to use our available data in Spain to, to, to really define all these systems. So, well, at the end, based on an adaptation from the national ecosystem assessment from Spain, we adapted and updated that and we developed some kind of um, new version of this uh, ecosystem map. Another important challenge is, is, is because national statistical offices and ministry, they 
attacks. For sure, they don't want to do this because they are interested in doing any kind of research on this topic. Is because, well, they see that there's a new regulation coming on in Europe. There might be some implications for policy uptakes for that. But they are kind of scared, at least in Spain, about reporting systems. So they will have to report to the Eurostat and other bodies, probably even globally. And um, uh, we wanted to make sure that our approach, especially with the um, ecosystem typology, could be somehow crosswalk about all the different classification systems globally, European level, national, and even local. Uh, so we really make an effort to try to crosswalk all these systems and how can we report from uh, national level to functional groups, maybe at a global or even regional European level. So we, we spend some time of how our classification system can be linked to other classification systems. Importantly also, and this took a lot of time for us, which data we use for developing the accounts. And the base for this is with, in Spain, we have this Lulu CF, the land use and land use change for forestry, which is a very multi-source data set for ecosystem accounting. And we have used it with quite good high spatial resolution of 25 meters and with significant time period from 1970 to 2015. And if you can see, this is a national data source, but it's composed with Spanish forest maps, crop and harvest map, Greenland cover. So there is kind of a standardized system with aggregation of many data sources that can provide us like a, the, the main data information to develop the accounts. So when we, this is taken, this looks like quite old already, <laughs> but this was in the proposal. And in Spain, uh, our deal uh, on the proposal was that uh, we at the university will work at national level. Uh, uh, Cesic, uh, Alejandro and his team will work from Andalusia and the regional levels. And we will try to work through some of these core accounts, especially in extent conditioned ecosystem services, supply and use, and probably some biodiversity. We didn't um, plan to do any kind of ecosystem service in monetary terms, but at the end, through the collaboration together with uh, the team from Alejandro and CESIC, we thought that it was good to have some kind of national level approach on, on using uh, some monetary evaluation as well. So we did even more than we expected. And, and in the proposal. Well, you know, this SIA framework, uh, uh, this is an adaptation. So in Spain, what we have, we can say that through the Maya process, these four years of intense work, we have a complex extent and conditioned account at national level. And uh, we are still working on ecosystem services accounts, supply and use and biodiversity. And as I said, these valuation techniques we are exploring now, as Alejandro was uh, uh, showing yesterday in his presentation. Okay, um, so yeah, I'm gonna go and give you an overview. I cannot go into any detail from all these uh, accounts that we have developed, but uh, the, the idea here is that we develop these accounts because in, in collaboration with the Ministry and the Statistical Office, and we are not responsible for reporting anything of that. So the main objective of developing this is to really test the methods, test the data sources, and provide some feedback to the Ministry and the Statistical Office how these methods and, and data sources work. So they can probably, hopefully in the future, they can use our, our work and really use it for the reporting at national level. But at the moment, uh, we just explore the data and the methods. So it was really our main task in, in developing these accounts. The, the, the first one that I'm, I'm presenting is the extent account. Uh, it was uh, developed uh, and tested at national level following the, the CIA principles of chapter four that Brand was presenting and is presented for all uh, ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystem in Spain. This has been already published, so you can I have leave there the link if you want to, to check it. So the first 
idea was to develop like the model that we will follow. So you you have all these land cover cartography, existing classification that I just presented, and then you have some outputs on uh, on flows and stocks changes and turnovers, which is the, what uh, the CIA recommendation is is proposing in his guidance. So, but it was kind of challenging to develop all this this system. You can see here the maps. We go at the national level, all these ecosystem classifications that I presented in 19, back to the 1970s to 2015, we were able to develop all these accounting at a really 25 meter resolution. So we, and we have for um, every, yeah, two, uh, 1970, 1990, 2000, 2006, 9, 12, and 15. So we have all these reporting periods where all these uh, accounts were developed and all these maps were also developed. Um, well, uh, uh, we develop all these, not only the maps, which is always uh, good and nice because visualize very well, but at the end, the, the CIA approach uh, give us some recommendation on how to report for statisticians. And we have all these accounting tables for, you see here an example of a few um, forest types. It's not all, but just a few of them. And what I, I just explained, all these results of the initial stem, the final stem, the tenorvers, and some reduction additions and, and, and changes in, into the system. So we did develop all of that for all these reporting periods. Um, and, and we also see the changes, not only from the final, from the beginning of, 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 of the reporting period, and, but the turnovers among all the ecosystem types, we were also capable to assess what are the main changes between is, uh, all these uh, different ecosystem types. So it's quite of a complementary information, but quite uh, useful and very good to see what is going on in all these uh, land cover changes in, in Spain for a long time period. So it's quite of a long story on changes in here that I cannot go into any details. Okay, the second account, uh, it was the condition accounts. This was probably the most challenging one that we faced uh, through the process because um, for the extent accounts, we, we knew that there was a lot of examples, good examples like Netherlands and others, good examples on extent accounts, but the condition accounts, um, yeah, it was a bit more challenging. We didn't find like a clear example ahead of us uh, pro proposing this uh, approach from SIA. So we adopted the guidance from uh, SIA chapter five and, and see how that works. So basically the SIA implementation is you select uh, uh, ecosystem types, you select some indicators, you select some reference areas, some aggregation scheme, and then you report. That is easy, but in each of these steps, there is a lot of um, yeah, challenge still on how to do it. Um, I'm going to present uh, this, how we did it only for forest ecosystems. Uh, so we will probably in future work uh, adapt this for other, other ecosystem types, but at the moment we only uh, present it for forest. Well, again, this is, the, this, this is not yet published. This is under review in environmental management and hopefully will be soon uh, available. And this is again the same model uh, that we develop to, to have the accounting maps and tables and, and all, all the information uh, recommended from SIA uh, based on this approach. Um, once that we have the ecosystem classifications, uh, we have to have all these indicator selection. This was really time consuming, took uh, out of a lot of time. So we follow the CIA in terms of abiotic, biotic, and landscape characteristics and looking at physical, chemical, compositional, structural, functional landscape characteristics. So we try to use indicators from remote sensing, national data, uh, model data. So it's a mix of multi-sources information from all these indicators. And based on how good these indicators 
represent condition and how reliable is this data, we assigned a wave into the aggregation scheme because we tested back and forth how that all this indicator works. And oh, for sure, at the, end, at the end, we have like, I, I don't know, uh, 10 or 11 indicators, but we start from probably even more than 20, and then we have to uh, scale down. And all this information is spatially explicit. Another important, he was the reference area. So uh, we try to use this primary forest, but in Spain we don't have primary forest. So we have to be creative and try to use this IUCN categories on level one and two. Uh, and we decide that our reference areas will be a combination between the best protector areas and that has not any change since 1970. So we decide that we will compare all the forest types with these uh, reference uh, areas and see how its indicator relates to these reference areas. So here are the results. Uh, you can see again, 2000, 2015, all the forest, what is in red is, let's say, in bad condition, what is in green is in good condition, and yellow is, is in something in between. And there is some not very significant changes, uh, but uh, well, depending if you zoom in, you can see a lot of uh, details on what's going on. In some parts has been an improvement, some parts has been a degradation, and some parts has been stable. So we were able to develop all this um, information, and, and we are still trying to see an understanding how, uh, what is changing in our forest condition. Yeah, we have to move. Um, the condition index is only, not only reported in maps, we can have all these uh, different ecosystem types and how they're reporting the changes in the, uh, uh, during time. I'm gonna very briefly present you in ecosystem services accounts in biophysical, not in monetary terms. We have a lot of work based on, on our work in, in the past, but I'm going to present only a few examples of what are we doing now in ecosystem service accounts. Uh, in national level, we develop, and this is already published, a national ecosystem carbon account for marine areas at the national territory. So this is already published, and we have all this map and even develop some models on future scenarios. We are now working on the terrestrial side of all the um, uh, carbon sequestration accounts at terrestrial as well. We have uh, different data sources and we have, well, different um, carbon stocks that we are uh, trying to assess. And we have some preliminary results uh, of these carbon accounts in all terrestrial ecosystem in Spain. But this has to be uh, uh, refined and reviewed yet <laughs> before we can publish it. Elan presented yesterday. We are also working together with Lars and Elan on this aesthetic quality of the landscape. Uh, there is, has been developed a methodology using uh, artificial intelligence and social networks uh, in UK and the Netherlands, and they invited us to participate with uh, this in Spain. So we have developed a national questionnaire to verify this model and how this works in, in Spain, and we have developed all this and this and their process again. It's not yet finished. And finally, this uh, biodiversity account uh, is also using the habitat directive of, of the, the colleagues from, from Greece were presenting, Panagiotis was presenting, it's, it's quite similar. So we use the same national habitat directive and bird directives and using this machine learning and some other tools, we are trying to model all this biodiversity. And you can see an example here, birds richness between two time periods and how this is changing. Uh, but we have all this information for all these different biodiversity uh, taxes. This information is available. We have sent all this information to the Maya viewer. So all this, at least the finalized information, is already uh, available in the Maya viewer. All our national accounts are there. And we are also developing our own viewer because the Ministry and the Statistical Office of Spain we're quite keen on, on going into details, looking at the data. So we are using this RGIS uh, hub to di dialogue with them in, in all these results so they can look at them and, and have more detail. 
Okay, uh, sorry, I had a bit of more time, but yeah, this is all from my side. Yeah. Yes, we've got 19 minutes. <laughs> but thanks to all the five speakers, I think this was a very nice overview of what has been done, and we will continue in the afternoon to dive into the different countries. I guess everybody is hungry, but still maybe the chance for one or two questions from here or maybe online. Nothing online. Anything uh, that's not offline here, what is this? Uh, here in the group, Anna Logos group. Yes. Do we have a second? Uh, have you been in countries also working together with staff's offices and what has been very interest? In, in addition to a general one you have mentioned already. Yeah, to whom goes this? Who wants to answer this? I think yours then, I didn't get it. We, we didn't understand the question. Uh, um, but, but we didn't understand, but maybe it goes to your stat, uh, maybe? Or? Can you repeat the question, please? Stats offices as well. Uh, ah, in stats yes. offices, there are also environmental account, uh, yeah, environmental yeah. statistics units, and as you said, in the future, they will be responsible for reporting to Eurostat. So, have you been already interacting with them? And there is a question. Uh, why I ask this is, uh, you know, sometimes in stats offices, sometimes they think that uh, So, each presenter, quick yes and no yeah. answer. I, yeah, we did, and, and we have been quite in interactions, but uh, for sure, now the regulation is in, we will have, we will need much more, because there's a lot of challenges and issues and validations and data sources and things that we have not solved, yeah. Uh, yeah, for Belgium, Flanders specifically, there have been interactions. Uh, but as stated, the statistical office is quite small, so they will rely heavily on outsourcing anyway. Uh, they don't have the capacity, the manpower, mm. and also the geospatial capacities. They will have to rely on other administrations which do have this uh, capacity. Marco, any point on Eurostat cooperation? Uh, I would say that uh, Soile would be better to answer the question. She has been active in, in putting up a Finnish uh, network of uh, ecosystem accounting and, and uh, I guess uh, many others than us who are doing the ecological background work are more knowledgeable of, of the statistics part. Okay, yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Soile Onnen from the Finnish Environment Institute. And yes, we do have this collaboration, both uh, an ongoing discussion together with our statistical offices and, and, and the legal process to, to start implementing this regulation has just started. But of course, we are far, uh, really far away from really like working together with the statistical office in terms of, of building the accounts. But, but yeah, we have this... Uh, a close communication established. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I don't think we need to ask Eckhard Petri whether he's cooperating with Eurostat. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we will now move to lunch. I guess it's the same place like yesterday. No? Sander, Jome, where do we go for lunch? It's the same place coffee was. <laughs> One quick announcement before we would like to take a group picture. I guess all of you agreed, made a tick that it's okay to be in the picture. And the plan is to have it, I think, five to one. We will meet in front of the building.